Hey guys, this is Chris Dawson. And this is Russell Dilday here at Cow Horse Full Contact. We got Mark Michaels from Performance Horse Central backing us up with the uh, electronics board and all the technological side of this thing. And I uh, hope you guys enjoy this episode. This episode brought to you by Globe Life Family Heritage. Hey, so the other day, Travis came over and sold me some Globe Life insurance. Sold my wife some Globe Life insurance. And he's a pretty good salesman. But I don't know if he's as good as my wife. (laughs) (laughs) Because now he's sponsoring the podcast and he bought a whole bunch of meat. (laughs) Check him out at thethomasagencies.com. Which I was thinking... And we were talking about changing stuff. When you guys came to the cow horse and you talk about changing, how much you changed the reining in the cow horse? Because when I was young, you kind of get your lean changes. You get you a stop. You know, you're getting through the reining. What no one at that time recognized, the reining is the unvariable sport. Right. And when you guys came... It's a 220. Yeah. Because and, it's the invariable sport and you've got it down. Everyone else is just trying to get through it and then be good at the cow. Right. And that, <laughs> and that's one thing that and I, and I think Bob was the one that kind of taught us that is he's, just what you said. He said that's the one part of the three events that you have actually <laughs> the most control over. <laughs> so he go. said so he said why would you not make that consistent? You've got control of that part to a certain degree, right? You Mm -hmm. don't have the cow variable in there. But he's like, why would you not take advantage of that? You know, where, you know, and and so that's always been our, or my motto is I want a horse, I want to train him to be a plus half in every maneuver every day. I want that to be. Yeah. Pretty consistent, mm-hmm. whatever. If you'll now, do that, that's a 20 and a half. Yeah. And you're that's never a, upset about it. That's that. a 20 and a half. And now if you've got one that can really turn or really stop, you're going to get a one here and there. And now you're into the mid 20s, you know. And and so, you know, so that's always been my thought process, I think, because I just, that's kind of how I learned and whatnot. And I remember you saying that one day. I remember, I'm you, you probably don't even remember, but I think we were at Paso maybe. I don't remember when it was, but you said something to me about when that light came on for you about the raining and about the rain work, you know, and that part there, you don't have the cow variable. You, that's the one you got the most control over. Yeah. So why not work at it a little harder and get it more consistent so you can bank on, you know, having an 18 to a 20 right. score in the bank there for you. And I remember you said that to me one day um, that you were like, now I get it, or <laughs> now yeah. I understand, or something. I, I can't remember how you right. put it and whatnot, but, um, but you know, I, I came from more of, of, you know, I showed cow horses, right? I showed cow horses as a kid. You know, I went to the youth finals in the cow horse a couple different times and, and showed at quarter horse shows in the cow horse, but I never, when I was with Bob, I never really got the opportunity to really train a fraternity horse. I went and showed there my last year that I worked for him at the fraternity. Um, but his his cow, uh, uh, program was a lot different than most guys. And, and I didn't really grasp it when I was there. And so when I left there, that was the one thing that I worked very, very hard on was learning that and learning the connection of a horse to a cow. Cause there just wasn't a lot of that there. And so I knew how to do the reining, but I knew that I needed to learn how to work a cow and how to train my horse to work a cow. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the reining end of it, you know, when we came into it and started doing it, it was mm-hmm. always very consistent because just, that's what I knew the most of, you know, but in those early years, I, I mean, for sure was working my tail off. Cause I knew, I knew that I didn't know that much about it and I knew I needed to learn more about it. And, uh, probably the first person that really taught me really the connection of horse and cow was Annie. Mm. She was coming and getting help from me and the rain work, but I was getting a lot of help from her in that connection of horse and cow 
I knew the mechanics, but I did not know the connection at all. I didn't know it. I mean, just nobody had ever really taught me that. You just, you know, I either showed a horse that was old and established, and so it was how to keep it honest. So it was hooked. It was hooked already. So, you know, you're keeping his shoulders stood up and keeping them soft around the corner and, you know, all that good stuff that we, you got to do with those older horses. But I had never learned the young horse and how to teach them that connection to a cow. And so when I first went to Arizona, Annie started coming down, Annie Reynolds, Mm -hmm. um, and get, she, she wanted help with the raining and, you know, Annie had done it for a long time and, and, she was all about that connection of horse to cow. And I learned a lot from Annie. She, she taught me a lot about that. And then while I was in Arizona, uh, me and John would go over and ride with Al Dunning. Um, David Costello was down there at the time. We'd go ride with David Costello and, you know, learn more about the herd work and things like that. We were going and riding with Teddy and, you know, just trying to figure it out, you know, but that was the biggest thing that, that – and, and I knew that I was missing that, and I knew that I didn't know – because I just had never been taught. Nobody just had ever taught me that. And he is probably one of the biggest students of the whole game. Mm-hmm. That, that, you talk about somebody that has constantly progressed. Mm-hmm. And she's, she's a lot like me. It just – horses minds intrigue her yep you know and understanding that horse and understanding how they think and um and all that kind of stuff and me and annie rode together for a lot of years you know i would help her with the rain and she'd help me with my cow work you know and uh i think we helped each other a lot over the years for sure Mm -hmm. we did you know for sure we did but uh but that part always troubled me mentally like i knew that i needed to learn more about it and so I've spent a lot of years trying to understand that, you know, and trying to trying to figure it out. I felt like I was pretty good at the mechanics, but I was not getting the connection, you know. And it just took me a while to to get it and understand it. And like I said, you go and you watch guys and you talk with guys. And I rode with, I've rode with everybody. I've rode with everybody and just try and pick a little bit up here and there, mm-hmm. you know, and under just understanding that more and more and more and and you know obviously you get more and more comfortable with it over the years and and figuring it out but um but i knew that was my weakness you know because i wasn't raised around cattle i wasn't raised working cattle and like i said when i did have horses and i did do the cow horse nobody ever said nothing to me about horse and cow (laughs) it was just this is what you need to do and this is where you need to be here's the procedure here's how yeah Yeah. just go do it and go show you know and stop draw bring the nose yeah (laughs) well i never even got that (laughs) (laughs) ride by and look out the other way come back (laughs) you know and uh, so you know there again that was something that intrigued me you know and i gotta i gotta learn this i gotta understand it you know and and then i got into starting to cut more and uh and when i when i really wanted to learn about the cutting and i felt like i had a little bit more time and i and i wanted it for my herd work in the cow horse but i also wanted to learn it more for the for the raining or for the okay. uh, cutting um when i was in arizona this is when the pacific coast fraternity was still in burbank the cutting fraternity, oh, yeah. Pacific yeah. Coast cutting fraternity was in Burbank, and they used to have a big sale and oh yeah, you know the fraternity, and it was huge. I mean, huge. huge. And uh, so I used to fly over from Phoenix, or no, I just drove over. Yeah, I just drove over and just go watch, just go hang out and watch. And that's all I'd do. I'd just pull up a chair and watch. I'd go to the practice pen. I'd go watch, it, you know, the show pen and all that. And uh, and I remember though that first year that I went over there and did that. Uh, Ascension, that was the first year he came to the Snaffle Bit Fraternity, and he brought that paint horse. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I had known Ascension a little bit before that, but for some reason, I think we were stalled by each other or something, and we became really good friends at that fraternity. And anybody who knows Sanch is like, mm-hmm. you know, once once he wraps his arm around you, he's got You're you in. for life. Yeah. yeah, you know, and... and uh, 
And he started helping me there with my horse, telling me little things here and there, you know, and he was asking me about the rain and all that's all, you know, because, and anyway, so I go to the, I go to Burbank and they're there. And so he sees me, what are you doing, Todd? You know, what, what you, and I'm like, I'm just hanging out watching. Well, you want to ride one? I'm like, sure. You know, and he's like, oh, you know, come help us. We got a bunch to work. And so I'm just sitting on horses and watching him work and, and, uh, typical since he owned fashion he hands me this cute little bay horse and he goes come work him and i'm like no i'm you know i'm I'm just here to watch no come work him you need him to rain or what you know (laughs) and so here i walk into the practice pen one-handed in a bridle and i got a sensione sitting in one side and i got tom line sitting on the other side (laughs) And Asensión goes, just go cut a cow out. He says, I just want to see how the horse works. Okay. <laughs> and I'm nervous as all get out, you know. So I cut this cow out, and I'm going back and forth across there. And I go over to Asensión's side, and he'd be like, now easy, easy. Now just smooch to him a little, just, just a little bit. And then I'd come back over here to Tom Line's side, and he'd be like, spur him. Turn him over there. Get over there. And then I'd come back over and say, easy now, easy. Just a little bit. And so... <laughs> so I'm, I'm like, I'm really confused now. I don't really have any idea what just happened. And then I find out that was a sense he owns Fort Worth horse that year. <laughs> I'm like, I just worked since his Fort Worth horse, and I probably completely screwed this thing up, you know. <laughs> but, but anyways, just the point of my story was just there to learn, you know. I just wanted yeah. to learn. And, I, I mean, I'm sure my wife thought I was just insane because I would go do that all the time. I'm like, where are you going? I'm just going to go watch, you know. Yeah. Why do you want to do that? Well, I just want to learn. You know, i got to figure this crap out. you got to get better. Yeah. And so I'm sitting in the stands watching, and there's Matt Gaines sitting there. He's just sitting there doing nothing. You know, and at that time, Matt was the guy. I mean, he was winning King. everything, and everybody's trying to be Matt Gaines, you know. And I'm like, holy cow, that's Matt Gaines right there. Man, I would love to ride with that guy someday, you know. And so I'm just like, ah, screw it. And I just go sit down next to him, and I introduce myself to him, and we start chatting it up, talking, watching. And I'm like, hey, you think there's ever a chance I could come ride with you? It's like, yeah, whenever you want. Exchange phone numbers. And from then on, I went every year for, man, four years probably. I did it four years in a row. And I'd buy myself a plane ticket, rent myself a car, drive out to his place, he had a little uh, that little apartment above the arena there when he was there on Tin Top, or not Tin Top on Bethel, mm-hmm. uh, right across from Bar H. There they were on Bethel, right? Yeah, I think we, so. yeah, they were right across from Bar H, and uh, he'd let me stay in there, and he just put me to work. I mean, like he just like we'd go out to that round pin, and it was him and me, and Clint Allen was there working at the time. Uh. Um, another kid they just called Little Matt, and I don't remember who else was there. But them girls, you know, they're loping them, saddling them, and bringing them. And I'd just stay in that round pin, and he'd be like, "Work that one." I'd work it and work this one. And they just and I'd just stay in there all day and work horses. And then they might go inside and work flat. They might go to the Silverado and show that weekend, and I'd go with them and watch and all that. And that really flipped the light switch on for me where I felt like, okay, I'm starting to get it now. I'm starting to understand what they're after, what makes it when, if this horse does this, this is why, you know, if, if, if he's not doing this, this is what's going to, and, and just kind of really, it really turned the light on for me. I think that was kind of my turning point right there. The bad part though, and Matt was awesome. I mean, just, he didn't know me. And just let me come in, spend a whole week, and I did it every year for about four years. And got to see him work the likes of one-time Pepto and little Pepto gal, and I'm counting checks, and I knew I would. And, I mean, some of the great horses he showed, I got to be there and see him watch, watch him work them and see those horses and got to become very close friends with Clint Allen. And, anyways, the bad part, though, 
was I went home and I tried to do that on my cow horses. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't go so good. <laughs> Dang it. You got to find that blend. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's what I quickly figured that out. And I was like, yeah, these horses aren't near as cowy as old little Pepto gal is, you know? And, and uh, so, you know, but, but that's all a learning process, right? And, and if I wouldn't have just taken that initiative to go do that, I would have, to this day, I'd probably still be trying to figure that out, you know, but it really, it really just turned that light switch on for me. And it, it, it just became very clear way. I shouldn't say very clear, but way clearer where I was like, Oh, I get it now. Cause I, cause the biggest thing was I got to feel it, you know, like I, I could watch a horse and go, that's how I want him to work, but I didn't know how to get him there. Mm-hmm. And when he put me on those horses and he would just tell me little things, you know, you're a little too quick there, or wait a little longer there, or move that rib cage out there or whatever. And I could feel it because he had it on him. I was like, oh, there it is. You know, and that. At least uh, now you have your goal. Yeah. And that, yeah. then, like I said, it caused me a lot of problems there for a while because, you know, I'm trying to take all them things and make them work like that. And it wasn't going so well. But uh, right away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned, you know, and to me, that's that's horse training trial and error, you know, for sure it is. I don't know about you guys, but oh yeah, I, I've I've done them wrong and then figured out that okay, there's error, <laughs> error, <go>. error, <laughs> error, <laughs> delete, delete, <laughs> delete, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then try again. But uh, but like I said, that's just that's just been me. I mean, I just I don't know why it just intrigues me, and I got to figure it out. I, I but. I feel like that's what's made me successful as a horse trainer too, you know, and, and, and just understanding it and, you know, trying to do it. So, but, uh, I'll tell you one thing though. I, I being down here in Texas and, and having the cattle to work where I'm at right now and, and the, availability of shows around here and man it's it's pretty cool down here i believe me i miss my place in oregon so much and i'm not saying that i'm moved down here and going to be here the rest of my life or anything but but man it's pretty cool down here not much skiing not much skiing no no (laughs) if there was snow there's no slope yeah (laughs) (laughs) But uh, it's, sometimes when it does snow, we'll be like just put like a uh, rubber mat behind a four wheel or something. And we'll usually drag the interns up and down the road. And that's kind of it's as a, close to it's skiing. It's a pretty short plane ride to Colorado, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's it's pretty cool. It's uh, I, I've enjoyed my time down here as far as training horses, you know. But uh, but it's been a lot so, less driving, that's for sure. Mm, whew, man, yeah, no kidding. I still think we ought to put on a horse show in the Northwest. Okay. <laughs> There's Idaho. I started There's one I this think week. it's going yeah. this week right, right now. Yeah, I used to go to that one. So how'd you meet the mother of my children? So <laughs> I know exactly who he's talking about. Uh, so when I was working, when Over I was a box working. box of clothes, man. Yeah. When I was working for Bob, so we, we had... Like I said, when we worked for Bob, you did everything. So, like on your lunch break, you were either running to town to get feed or you were, you know, you were always doing something. You never very rarely went to the house and ate sandwich and then went back to work. You were <laughs> driving. To, but anyways, so the local co-op there um, was Wilco Co-op, or I think that's what it's called now. It might have been. But anyway, farm store, you know. Um so you were always having to go get supplies, right? You know, getting yeah. something from there, whatever. So me and Robbie Boyce, the way we go to town, we got to get supplies. So, of course, you know, we're 20-something years old, and, you know, you know how it is when you go to town. You oh, know, yeah. You're, you're, the radar is always going. Always you know? looking. It's always, always going, you know. <laughs> and uh, so we'd been in there a couple times and seen this one girl in there, cashier. She's pretty cute, you know. So we go in there that day. And there she is again. I'm like, hey, there's hardly anybody in her line. Let's go there. Let's go down there. <laughs> so we go down there, and it's Missy. And uh, 
we check out our stuff and, you know, make a little small talk and away we go. And, you know, as we get back in the truck, we're like, yeah, she's pretty hot. You know, yeah, that girl's pretty cute. So then I go to the next quarter horse show and one of the other trainers there, they've got a non-pro girl riding with them and it is Missy's sister. I don't know any of this at the time. I don't know any of this, but her sister is riding. She has an all-around horse, and she's riding with this other trainer. Well, I know the other trainer, him and his wife, very well and stuff, and we all kind of grew up showing together and stuff. And Anyways, Missy comes to the show to watch her sister show, right? Missy grew up doing high school rodeo. She ran barrels, tied goats. She did all that. Not horse show uh, at all. Yeah. Farm girl, dad grew grass seed. Uh, he was a big farmer up there in the Willamette Valley and stuff. And so they were farm girls, right? And they always had horses and stuff, but they were farm girls. <clears throat> anyway, so she comes to watch her sister Leslie show. Well, this other trainer, the wife, tells Missy that, like, oh, I've got a guy I want to set you up with. I, you just, you got to meet him. I want to set you up with him. I don't know any of this till later, right? Right. And uh, so... Missy's like, I ain't dating no horse show boy, you know? <laughs> you know? And no, none of them horse show boys. No way. no way. No way. And she had just gotten out of a, she had been in a pretty long relationship and it ended bad and whatnot. So she, I, I don't think she was really wanting any relationship. Another one. Another one, whatever, yeah. especially not a horse show boy, right. you know? <laughs> and uh, we all go out that night. And sure enough, there she is. And so they introduce us and whatnot. And I'm like, hey. I know you. You're the co-op. You work at the co-op. Yeah. And I'm like, well, we, just, we just myself into your line. We just went through there the other day. And she's like, yeah, I remember you guys and everything. Well, you know, we go to the bar and do the whole deal and, and all that. And that was kind of our first time together. And she's, you know, living back at home. At that time, her, her parents lived in Amity, which is just right in the same area as Yamhill. It's all just a big farming community up there and and stuff like that. And it was really, it's like 20 minutes apart, you know. But McMinnville is the main town there. It's the, it's the biggest town. And then Amity and Yamhill and Carlton and Dayton, they're all just little towns outside of Yamhill. So anyways, we lived right in the same area. Okay, and uh, so, yeah, then uh, I think she comes to the next show, and we all go out again, maybe, and now we're kind of dating and seeing each other and whatnot, and so then a whole big group of us is going to go out up in that area. This isn't a horse show. We're all at home, <clears throat> and there's this big place um, up outside of Yam Hill. It's called the Flying M Ranch, and it's kind of a – it's up in the mountains, and there's like this big old lodge up there with a restaurant and a big, you know, uh, bar. And I think you can, it's been so long since I've been up there, but a lot of people go up there and camp and trail ride. Oh. And it's just beautiful area up there and whatnot. But, anyways, it was kind of the thing to do, you know, on a Saturday night. Hey, let's go up to the Flying M and go to the bar. You know, there's always a live band and, you know, drink and dance and, you know, all the crazy stuff you did as a kid. And, so we, a whole big group of us go up there, and so now me and Missy, are, we're kind of dating now, you know, or we've been, you know, chatting it up on the phone and going out a little bit. And so we all go up there, and, you know, we carry on all night. And uh, I, I'll never forget her sister was there, her middle sister. She's got two sisters, one that's Leslie's the youngest one, and then Nicole's the middle one, and then Missy's the oldest. And Nicole is up there with us. And I'll never, because we were dating pretty good then, and I'll never forget Nicole comes up to me and she goes, you hurt my sister, I'll kick your ass or something like that, you know? And I'm like, oh, crap, you know? Because she had been hurt pretty bad in a previous relationship. Right. And uh, anyways, so, I mean, anybody that knows me, and I'm not much of a drinker. And anyways, we drink and dance and all that. Well, we get this bright idea, let's go skiing tomorrow. <laughs> So everybody's like, yeah, yeah, let's go skiing. Because there's a mountain that's about an hour and a half away and, and stuff. So everybody's like, yeah, let's go skiing tomorrow. So to so we decide that just because of where we're at and then where we have to go the next day, 
we're going to stop at my place, get my ski gear, and then we're all going to go to Missy's place and I'll stay the night so she can get her ski gear and the other people that live right there, they can get theirs, and then we'll leave from there to go to the mountain, right? So stop at my place, grab, you know, of course, you know, it's one o'clock in the morning, you know, <laughs> ball been drinking and get my stuff. And now we go to Missy's and she lives in uh, like a double wide trailer house or whatever, just down the road from her parents. Oh. But she, but she lives at, she lives by herself or whatever, but she's not living with her parents, but it's literally close a quarter mile from, yeah. on the, just down the road. So she's like, well, everybody will just crash here, and then in the morning I'll just go to my parents, grab my stuff, and we're gone. So there's a whole big group of us. So, you know, Missy goes to her bedroom. All of us just crash on the couch or on the floor or whatever. And I'm kind of liking this girl, you know. I'm thinking, you know. Maybe. Maybe, you know. <laughs> and so we all crash, and we wake up in the morning. <laughs> and... I remember getting up, and Missy's already out in the kitchen or something, and she kind of st- comes out to the living room, and here comes this little girl. How old's Hadley? Three. About a three-year-old girl <laughs> comes down the hallway and is going, Mommy, 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 and runs and jumps in Missy's arms. And I'm like, you, you got to <laughs> be kidding me. <laughs> And Finally, I find one I like, and she's got baggage. <laughs> I'm like, oh. not ready to be a stepdad. Man, I was so disappointed. I mean, I was just like, I'm going home. I'm not going skiing. <laughs> and then this, over, and there's a kid. Yeah, and then this other gal comes walking down the hallway. Well, it's her roommate. <laughs> well, find out that Missy babysits this little girl a lot. And calls her mommy a lot, oh, wow. but it's the roommate's little girl. And I'm like, <laughs> so okay. she told you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. Whew, that was a close one, you know. Okay, we're still good. Let's go skiing, you know. And uh, so we get in Missy's car, and we drive to her parents' house. Well, in this time, I'm not feeling too good. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> oh, no. Um, um, yeah, it's like about... 30 degrees outside, and I'm sweating bullets. I mean, I'm not feeling good. And so we drive up to her folks' house, and her folks have a farm there. You know, they've got a lot of acreage right on the farm that they grow a lot of grass seed and stuff, and they've got this big old dairy barn that they've converted and this big old granary, and it's a really, really cool old barn. They're about, I think they said they were like fourth or fifth generation to live there on that farm Mm. on Hal's side. Her dad's side. And anyways, so she pulls up and she's like, I'm going to go in and get my ski stuff. And and I'm like, okay. And she's like, well, you coming in? And I'm like, no, I think I'll wait here. (laughs) I'll be puking in the back of the car. Well, so I'm getting to that. And so (laughs) I'm sitting in the car and I got the window down. And oh, man, here it comes. And I'm feeling bad and I'm going to throw up. And I'm like, oh, crap. Oh, crap. Here it comes. Here it comes. So I get out of the car, and I go around the side of the house. Oh, nope, there's the kitchen windows. Can't go there. So <laughs> go over to the side, and I'm like, I'm trying to find a bush because it's coming up. And about as I'm trying to find this bush, here comes her dad from the <laughs> barn because he's been out feeding horses and cows. And I'm like, you know... You know how a dog, when they're trying to find their place to go do their business, and they're like, "Go!" that, that was me. And, I'm like, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, no, here's Dad. And, and he's like, hey, can I help you? You know, he doesn't know. He, I've never met him. He doesn't yeah, know. Yeah, right. No idea. And I'm like, oh, you're just here with Missy. We're going to go skiing today. Oh, well, I'm Hal. And he comes over and shakes my hand. And he's like, well, you want to come in? We, you know, have a cup of coffee or something? And. Oh, no, Hallie sh- or Missy, she'll be out in just a sec, you know, and, and I'm trying to avoid this. Well, then here comes her mom. <laughs> You've not yet. No, heard. I haven't thrown up. No, no, I've, I'm Still keep, there. keeping her down, you know, oh. and uh, now mom's out there, too. So now I'm meeting Hal and Andy, my future in-laws. <laughs> 
for the first time, I know I'm so pale. <laughs> And I know I look like and hell. so do they. Yeah. And, you know, we're chatting it up and, you know, introducing ourselves. And she's got some hot chocolate and cookies for me. And and I'm like, oh, God. I got some cookies for you, too. <laughs> yeah. And and anyways, I somehow managed to keep her down. And. Oh, Missy comes out with her stuff. We throw it in the car, and away we go. And she's like, you're driving. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and her and her friend, I pass mean, out. pass out. <laughs> and I got to drive the whole way. And, you know, it's an hour and a half, two hours up there. And I feel so bad. And they're pretty hungover, too. And <laughs> we didn't ski a whole lot. We skied, but we... <laughs> Anyways, that was yeah, that was my one of my first dates with my future wife and meeting the in laws and uh, but no, it's, it's may get impressed. Yeah, but it's it's <laughs> been didn't throw up on their shoes. No, yeah, it no. could have been, been, been worse. Could have been worse. Yeah, but no, her her folks are awesome. Uh, yeah, so then we dated for we dated for three years and then. I know I'm going to ask her to marry me. Maybe I already had asked her, and I don't. Did you ask the dad? I did. Well, I remember sitting in the living room, and we're all sitting there watching a movie or something, and I got to ask her dad. I couldn't tell you what movie it was, and I have no idea what happened because the whole time I was just sitting there going, I need to I ask her dad. Ask. I got to ask her dad. How am I going to ask her dad? <laughs> and and I'm like, okay, everybody else needs to leave the room. How am I going to do this? How is everybody else going to leave the room? But Fire. I, yeah. And so finally the girls get up to, you know, whatever to go in the kitchen. And and I asked him. And Hal, if, Hal's just, he's just a great guy. I mean, he the stories that my wife has told me about growing up with him and how what he, I mean, them girls, he's got three girls and he had a farm. And all three of them girls, they can drive a combine, drive a tractor, they can change tires, they can, you name it, they can do it. Because, I mean, he taught them, taught them well, and they're all very independent. And, you know, he taught them how to be independent and take care of themselves. And a lot of, a lot of really good learning experiences and, He's, he's just a really fun guy. He's kind of up in that area. Every farmer up there looks up to Hal. Like, if they've got questions about farming, they go to Hal, you know. And, and he retired from farming, I don't know, quite a while ago. And and uh, then he just sold some real estate. And now he's pretty much retired and stuff. He's he's had quite a few, not so much health issues, but just body issues, mm -hmm. you know. He's really bad arthritis and um, he just had a knee replaced, and you know, so he's slowed down quite a bit. But he's helped us. He that guy can build. He used to build houses. He was a finished carpenter. He, mm. you know, farmer for how many years? So they can fix anything, you know. And and uh, that was really hard on me for a lot of years because we'd be doing something around our ranch, and my wife would be like, "Well, my dad wouldn't do it that way." <laughs> <laughs> And that was hard on my ego, you know? Yeah, I mean, I barely knew how to drive a tractor, let alone fix anything. And she'd just be like, well, let's call my dad. And I'm like, no, I got it. I got, I got him. It. I can do it. Duh, okay, you know? call him. <laughs> yeah. And that's what it usually, and he'd be like, well, what did you guys do? And, well, I wouldn't have done that, you know? <laughs> but, no, great, great. Kids these days. Yeah, yeah. Great, great people. But, yeah, I, yeah, I got up the courage to ask him and then... Uh, Asked my wife to marry me, and then, uh, and before we even got married, we bought our first house. And I remember my dad; he was helping us with that. And he's like, "Is there something you want to tell me?" And I hadn't, <laughs> I hadn't told him. I'm like, "Well, yeah, we're getting married." You know, I hadn't even told him yet. But uh, what did Hal say when you asked him? I'm, I was just sitting here <laughs> trying to remember. He had; it was very dry. That's just kind of how he is. He was just kind of like, "Yeah, well, okay." Yeah, if you want her or something like that, you know. I mean, it was just, it was just something really, you know, just, just so typical. How you know, just, you know, okay, just take good care of her. You know, that was about it. You know, he, no, he's a really cool guy. They're they're great people, really great people. And 
um, have been great grandparents to my kids. And both of our parents have. They're great grandparents to our kids. And but Hallie's mom. So, like, Missy's household, it was, you know how there's always that one house that, like, all the kids go to or everybody always hangs out or yeah, that was their house. I mean... Missy's told me stories about when they were kids and all the things they used to do and all the people that used to be there and they would have exchange students live with them and they that was just that's just that's just been that family you know they just you you could you could show up at 11 o'clock at night and Andy you know she'd open the door and let you in and feed you Mm. you know I mean that's just I mean, just great people that way, you know, and always it it didn't matter what it was, if somebody needed help with something or whatever, that's where you went, Mm. you know, they would, they would do it for you and help you and whatnot. And, and just a real pillar in that community in that farming community, granted her family and his family had been there for years. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and the Sheldon family had been there in that, in that area for years and years and years as farmers. So like I said, everybody always looked up to how, uh, you know, whatever they were doing farming wise. And, um, and then Missy's, it, it was, it was really hard because they always did everything for everybody, right? Just going all the time, helping everybody, whatever, doing their deal, whatnot. And then Missy's mom, uh, got cancer about, how many years has it been now? It's five years ago. Um, Non-Hodgkin, is that, is that right? Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, mm-hmm. whatever, what she had. and But it had eaten away at her hip bone and like into her pelvis. And so all of the bone was just like, it looked like Swiss cheese. Like she started having a lot of pain in her, in her hip and stuff. And she thought that she just stepped wrong or whatever. Mm-hmm. Anyways, went to the doctor for that. And then found out that she had cancer. And it just, you know, anybody who's been through cancer and and the whole deal. And anyways, it was just really, it was just really strange. And it was really hard to see because they were once so active. And they were, I don't know if you'd call them the leaders. But like I said, everybody always came there, mm-hmm. right? I mean, if there was a get-together, it was at the Sheldon Ranch. If somebody needed help, Sheldon's went and helped them. If... Somebody needed to borrow a tractor, they borrowed Sheldon's tractor. If they, you know, whatever. It was just, they were the ones always doing all that stuff. And then she got cancer, and it just, it just seemed so different going up there. And, I mean, my wife and her sisters, whatever, I mean, they dropped everything that they were doing and went up there to take care of their mom, you know, Mm. and, and. Her dad, like I said, he's had a lot of not so much health issues, but just structural issues. And so he's slowed down a lot, you know. And I mean, they're still very young at heart and whatnot, but it's, it just really, this last five years have just really took its toll on them. And, and her mom is good now, um, cancer free, mm. went through all the stuff, had two different surgeries on her hip to put it back together. If I showed you the x-rays, it would blow your mind what they did. Crazy like, what they Like had do. to like cement it back together oh. and fill it in and screws and pins and mm. and all this stuff. And she still has to use a cane, and but she gets around now and, and is good and, you know, feels good now and more back to herself. But it just really slowed her down for sure. And it was just really hard to see those two who were so active and just going and doing – and you'd go up there and both of them just not doing a whole lot, mm. you know. And but um, but what a great family they are. I mean, just like I say, my wife is so much like her mom in that sense. Like my wife is like do anything for anybody. You know, if if somebody needs help, yeah. I mean, she could be right in the middle of the biggest project of her life, and it, it's she drops it and goes. You yeah. know, and she's just amazing that way. And and my wife is, you know, well, you've all met her. <laughs> I mean, 
Double nickel. <laughs> oh, double nickel, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, hun, but yeah. <laughs> they wanted to know. <laughs> um, but uh, she, uh, she helped me in my business so much because when I was younger, I was so focused on training and winning. I mean, that was just my focus, and that's all I wanted to do. She taught me just like what we were talking about. And if I didn't have her, I would probably be one of those guys that we talked about earlier. She taught me the importance of taking care of your customers, socializing with your customers, going to dinner with them, talking to them, calling them on the phone, giving them updates, all that. And to this day, she still rides me like, did you call them? Did you call them? You know, Mm -hmm. because, you know, that's, but she was was so good at that and she knew I was that way and like when I was at the Rainins and when I was doing really good at the Rainins and stuff and that Rainin fraternity would just kick your butt I mean it was long you know you had to ride in the middle of the night to school your horses and then showing all day and you know and when you're younger you take everything so personal and so to heart and it was so stressful and I had some big dollar customers and 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 I was kind of the guy there for a while, and so everybody wants a piece of you, right? Everybody yep. wants to talk to you. Everybody yep. wants an interview. Everybody wants to send you a horse. Everybody wants you to buy a horse, you know. And you're just getting pulled so many directions. And my wife was so awesome at just grabbing them and let's just go over here and talk. And she could see me, you know, trying to focus on what I do, and she would just go take care of them. Mm-hmm. And she'd go have a drink with them and she'd go out to dinner with them if I was too tired or, you know, and she would just do that stuff and everybody just grew to love my wife, you know, and if it weren't for her, I can guarantee I wouldn't have half the customers I had (laughs) because she just took care of them that way. And then they love to come around because my wife's a hoot. Yeah. She's fun. She's a blast. She's so much fun. And, 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 you know, I was just always so serious and so focused and I just want to ride and do good for these people. But it would come across as rude and don't, right, whatever. Right. But I, I just wanted to do good for them, you know, and I wanted to do my job. And and she knew that about me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> because she would just, you, I, I would just see her and she would pretty soon, there she goes with them. And now they're up in the lounge and having a drink and you know, whatnot, and she's, you know, rubbing elbows with them and letting me go do my job, you know, and she's been so good for me that way, and she taught me that, you know, and I've become better about that over the years uh, with my customers and people and stuff like that because naturally I'm pretty shy, really, and Mm -hmm. and a lot of people I know took that as arrogant for a long time because I just didn't talk. A lot, you know, but I, uh, I, uh, to be honest with you, just naturally pretty shy. Yeah, you know, introvert a little bit. Yep, yep. But uh, she's definitely brought me out of my shell. The opposites bit. attack. It, they, attract. they do. Yeah, for sure. You know, and I think about that all the time. You know, and I think about my parents. My dad's a goer and a leader and all that, and my mom more like me, shy mm. and a little more reserved, and you know, and. So yeah, it's it's strange, but no, she's she's been awesome, awesome, and then uh, big part of my business that way. And then uh, we, she never was really the like the barn, like at the barn and helping with the horses and all that. Um, she would help around the ranch. Obviously, she grew up around farming and all that, so she knew how to drive tractor, and it would. It would not be uncommon at all for me to go to a horse show and I come home and she's like, you know, tore out <laughs> five trees and <laughs> planted a garden or something. Or, you know, I, I can remember when we were building our place. So we bought the ranch and it had everything on there. I've added to it a lot and stuff, but like the arena and the barns and some other outbuildings and all the pastures and fencing, that was all there, but there was no house on the place. And so we lived just down the road for three years and just saved every penny I won or made or whatnot. And then we built our house. And I mean, she took that project on and I mean, I pretty much let her do it all because I was just like, I got to train these horses, you know, and, 
And uh, I said, you can have at her, but I said, there's one room that I want to have a little bit of say in how it is, and that was the great room, you know. And But, uh, no, we we did a lot together, but, but she really has done way more than I ever did on any of that stuff. But I can remember coming home, and, shoot, there's a new building up, and I'm like <laughs> – <laughs> where'd that come well we needed one so i got i called a guy and got him out i mean that was just her you know she just takes the initiative and just goes and does it you know she's awesome that way but uh but then we had kids and you know from then on it was pretty much missy took care of all the billing all the book work taxes all of that stuff i took care of the barn the training yeah the customers things like that and and it took a little bit uh there was a few years in there where it was a little rocky <laughs> you know <laughs> and just trying to learn our way through it you know and that's all it really was was just trying to you know now we've got this business together and we own this place together and how do we do this you know and she's she's pretty strong and she's pretty much wanting to be the leader <laughs> and i'm pretty much like no I, I know how to do this leave me alone you know and so <laughs> You know, we butted heads there for a little bit, but but then we kind of found our what worked for us, you know, and we found that that's what kind of worked best. And um, like I said, then when we had kids, you know, then she was at home raising those kids, and I was on the road, you know, going and and. Uh, How old were y'all when you had kids? So we waited quite a while. Uh, so Gavin is nineteen. I'm fifty four. You guys do the math. Yeah. Uh, 30, 35? 35. Yeah. So, no. Is it that was? Were we that mm -hmm. old? Yeah. You told him to do the math. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were, yeah. So, but though. Damn, you were old. Yeah, we were old. But you know what? I mean, <laughs> we purposely waited a little bit. For one, in my mind, I felt like I was too selfish at the time to have kids. And when I say selfish, I meant I was so concerned with my profession and my career. Like I knew that I was a little intense about all that. And I knew that, that I really wanted it really, really bad. And I felt like I was going to be so consumed in that, that I don't need to have a child because I'm not going to be, a great parent because I'm going to be so consumed in this. Mm -hmm. And we had just had bought the place. And um, how old were you when you got married? Uh, so we got married in '94. So I was 25. Is that right? I'll be damned. Yeah. Same year we got married. Like Ten years. Yeah. So, um, but then once we got the place and and we're getting the house started and built, I think we'd gotten moved in. Um, you know, then I was feeling more grounded and more like, you know, okay, I kind of got things going now, you know. But, but so we purposely kind of waited a little bit. Maybe we waited a little too long, but I don't think so, because I have I, I always I always had it in my head that I wanted to be in a position financially that I could provide those kids with whatever they wanted to do, and and I didn't want I didn't want finances to hold my kids back if they had a passion for something. Um, you know, if they wanted to ride, I wanted to be able to be able to buy them a horse. If they wanted, you know, a dirt bike, I would be able to buy them a dirt bike, you know. I, and so in my mind, what that's... What if it was math? <laughs> that's always your question. <laughs> well, it's readily available around there. So it's a bit too hard. They can buy their own darn math. <laughs> <laughs> You're on your own there, son. <laughs> uh, no, I, mean, I was 38 yeah. when we had Adley. Yeah. So, I mean. Yeah, I was the same uh, as Todd. Yeah. But, I, but, that, but that was just my thought process, you know, is I just wanted to be able to provide them and, and let them have a, have a good. I didn't want finances to be the reason they couldn't do something. I wanted to be established and comfortable enough in, in what I was doing, you know, or, you know that I could do those things for him. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, that was just my thought process. But then when Missy got pregnant and then I started doing the math, I'm like, okay, when they graduate, <laughs> I'm going to be 54. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Oh, man. <laughs> Hell, man. 
<laughs> oh, it's been great though. I, I love I love the kids and doing that, and I love helping kids now. Um, my daughter's been doing the high school rodeo cutting, uh, and you know when we first started going and and doing it, I didn't really know any of the other people or parents or kids or whatever. And we've made some great friends there and some really good friends and good people. And it, I've gotten to the point now, and I think everybody was a little intimidated by me when I first came in because they knew who I was and what I did for a living. And, you know, and some of them didn't, but a lot of them did. And um, so I think it was a little hard on Hallie for a little bit because up there, it's a little different than down here in Texas, but you know, up there, I mean, they just rodeo. That's all they do. There's hardly any of them that are, that go horse mm-hmm. show or do mm-hmm. any of the other stuff, you know. And so, I get in there, and here comes Hallie, and I'm and and her uh, cousin, uh, Missy's sister's daughter. She was doing it too, and so I'm coaching both of them and helping them, and you know, so I'm going to the cuttings, and I'm, you know settling herds and sitting in the corner and helping them. And then pretty much, you know, if they asked me to sit in the corner to write, I mean, absolutely. I helped every person I could, you know, and then as I kind of got to know everybody, you know, this was three years ago. And now, I mean, like I sit in the corner, I settle every herd. I sit in the corner for every kid and pretty much coach every kid or talk them through a run. Because a lot of them don't know. Right. Some of mm-hmm. them do. Some of them yeah. do. And so you can help them. I've done some clinics for them and all that. And a lot of the parents and the kids were kind of taken back by that. They're like, you'll you'll really help the other kids that are trying to beat Hallie? I'm like, yeah, why not? I'm, you know, I want to help everybody, you know. And so now it's really fun. It's really cool because I know a lot of them pretty well. And to go there and just help those kids all day long sit in the corner and help them and they're coming to you afterwards and wanting to know what they did wrong and i've got several cow horse people that i've helped and coached and same thing you know now they they come to me for help and because there's really nobody else there that really does it mm-hmm. you know and whatnot and and it's just i i get so much i just get a kick out of helping those kids i love it it's I like love Deion it. sanders showing up to the little league game yeah 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 but I just I just love it and 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 man some of those kids they really have a passion for it and they want it. and you got your others that are just doing it for points all around points or whatever but you got some that like there's this one kid and the first year I went they were you know the girls are always talking about the other kids and of course they're talking about the other boys and there's this kid that rides rough stock and he rides bulls mainly and he was the best bull rider there and whatnot. And and they were saying he's pretty cool and all that kind of stuff. And I see him, and he definitely looks like a roughy, you know, how he's dressed <laughs> and all that. I'm like, yeah, stay away from him, you know. You know just whatever. showing him your dead pile. Yeah. <laughs> and anyways, uh, then last year he starts riding saddle bronc horses too. And, I mean, this kid rides, like rides good. Like I think he rides saddle bronc horses better than he rides bulls now. Like just in – like goes at it and works at it hard and and uh, gotten to know him a little bit and does seem like a pretty good kid. Well, this year shows up the first rodeo. He's got a cutter and a cow horse. <laughs> I'm like, where did this come from? And he has no idea what he's doing. No idea. None. None. And no, I take that back. At the end of last year, he showed up with a cow horse, and it was atrocious. <laughs> like, so bad. Then he shows up this year, and he's got a different one, and it's pretty good. It's not bad. And he's got a little cutter. Not bad. And so I started to have started helping him. And this is a great kid. This is a great kid, and he is ate up with it. He wants to know all about it all the time. They said he's up at 5 o'clock every morning feeding his horses, taking care of them, goes to school, comes home, gets those horses, goes to wherever, gets some help, and then goes and practices a saddle bronc or a bull. Or He's winning all arounds at the rodeo, and it's just a really good kid. But it's just my point being is it's been super fun to get to know him, and now he's in it and doing the cutting and the cow horse, and he craves it. Like, like he might like it more than rough stock. I don't know. 
but like he's all about it and stuff and so it's been a lot of fun seeing those kids grow and get better because i've been doing it for you know a few years now and i've given a few little clinics you know like before rodeo or something just to help the kids and they've all started showing better and the runs have gotten better and and the parents are just super appreciative of it and it's been a lot of fun doing that and going and doing that with hallie and um you know, and she goes to some NCHA cuttings when we can, you know, but between my schedule and mm. high school rodeo schedule and all that, we don't get to go to a lot of them. But she really likes the rodeo or the cutting. And she never, my son never got into the horses. He'll tell you, he's just not a horse person. <laughs> um, but he likes animals. He loves animals, but just never got into the horse deal at all. Uh, and Hallie never was like really into it. And then just, you know, she always rode here and there, you know, but wasn't like craving it or whatever. And, and I always, I always said, I will never pressure those kids into riding. If they want to ride, they know it's there, but I'm not going to make them ride, you know, just because that's what I do. And a lot of people ask you that question. You'll get asked it a lot, you know, and having kids, I'm sure you have too, but if, if either of them, never rode a horse it would not bother me one bit just because that's what i do doesn't mean that's what they have to do Mm -hmm. you know but i think it becomes a norm in the in the horse world or the rodeo world or whatever because that's the world that you grow up in and that's just as you we all know this is our life this is this is our world this is what we do you know and and you kind of got to live it and being consumed by it to to really do it right and Mm -hmm. it's a little different than just your normal job but but if they never if they never rode a horse, it wouldn't bother me, it, not at all. But she just all of a sudden kind of started riding a little bit, and and uh, I'm like, well, you want to, you know, you want to do the cow horse? And she's like, no, nope, I think I want to cut. I like the cutting. I'm like, let's go. And I went and bought her a WR Gildan, and that had been showing a lot, and she learned on him, and and uh, now she's showing. Uh, my old smooth a cat mare. You rode one out of her. Yep. Well, we were having trouble getting her bred, and so we pulled her. We just quit trying to breed her because we couldn't get her bred or keep staying full and got her back in shape. And so now she's been showing her because the gildan got a little sore, and he's been a little crippled this year. So she's been showing that mare this year. And, right on. And, uh, you know, just making runs and just learning as you go and stuff. And so it's been a lot of fun. But she's a very good rider. She rides very, very well, and she's pretty smart and just like typical kids, they're just a sponge, you know. You don't think they're paying attention, but they are. <laughs> she knows and all that, and, and she just sits a horse really good. You know, her timing and her feel and is very good on the back of a horse. I might be a little, you know, prejudiced, prejudiced a little bit, but <laughs> uh, she does. She sits a horse very well. And it's so funny because my son, if he gets on a horse, he looks like a sack of potatoes up there. His toes are pointed <laughs> down. He's flopping all over the place. My daughter gets on the horse, and she looks like she just came out of horsemanship school. You know, she just sits up so perfect. I'm like, what happened? I mean, where? So I mean, what's he going to school to be? Well, he he thought he wanted to be a vet. He, he uh, he like I said, animals, he really likes animals, and he likes that part of things, uh, anatomy and things like that. And then he got into college and realized that chemistry is really hard. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, so now he's not so sure he's, you know, this is his first year and, and he's kind of going through that stage of what do I want to do with my life? You know, and, and he's skiing. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, and I'm like, dude, you know, 99% of the kids here at this college are feeling the same way you are. So, (laughs) you know, so we, we just encouraged him to, Hey, whatever interests you take a class. Mm -hmm. If you think it's interesting, take a class. You never know, you know, and that's, that's kind of how I was with them growing up. If they showed any interest in anything, I'm like, let's go do it. I don't care what it was because I'm a firm believer. If you don't have passion about what you do, I don't care. Did we did we talked about it? We hit on it earlier. If you don't have passion about what you do, you're going to be miserable. I don't care how much money you make mm-hmm. if you if you don't really enjoy what you do. And so and that's how I've been with them. All of them is, uh, or I say all of them. My two kids is, if they showed interest in anything, I'm like, let's do it. Let's go. You know, because you just you just don't know what's going to trip their trigger, right? And no. uh, 
So with Gavin, you know, I think he's still searching right now, but uh, he came and spent. So for his senior project in in high school, um, he came down to Oklahoma, and he's gotten to know Joe Carter very well because Joe's come to my place for a lot of years now and knows him from the horse show. And anybody who knows Joe Carter, he's a great guy. He's a lot of fun and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And Gavin and him have become pretty good friends. And whenever Joe would come up to my place, he would usually always stay a day, and we would go fishing on the river and whatnot. And my kid likes to fish, and Joe loves to fish. And so they've become pretty close friends. So anyways, when Gavin was thinking the vet world sounded pretty good for his senior project – he came and he we flew him down to uh, Carter's place, and he spent the week there with with Jesse and Joe, and uh, they just took him in and made him a part of the team there at the vet clinic, and he got to be in on some live surgeries, he got to be in on some uh, just like he got to see the blood and gut side of it, and my kid is pretty laid back. He's, he's, he's happy go lucky. He's, you know, like if you said, let's, you know, let's go climb a mountain. He'd be like, okay, let's go. You know I mean? Just good to go and do whatever. And just real easy going. And, and he's just, to me, he never has really just like taken a hold of something. Like I kept waiting for him to just yeah. all through high school, like just yeah get, show me some passion anything. about something, anything, you know? And I went and so he gets done there and, uh, he flies home, and I go and pick him up at the airport, and we're driving back to the house. And I have never seen my kid that excited and that wound up about anything. He talked my ear off for two hours. We sat up and talked <laughs> for two hours afterwards, telling me all the stuff he got to see and do. And he was all about vet and being a vet. This is what I want to do. And then he got into school. <laughs> like, real? This chemistry is pretty hard. No, but you know, I he he still could, you know. But yeah. you know, first year, first year in college, and and doing all that. But uh, he's a he's a good kid, and uh, he's got a good heart, and you know. So we'll see where he where he ends up. But uh, you know, we've just encouraged him to whatever interest you go, go yeah. take a class. You never know, you know. I yeah. said, you know how many kids? I know so many people. I went to school for four or five years, got a degree, did all that, came out, got a job in that field, and went, Ew, I hate this. Mm-hmm. And now they do something completely different and don't yeah. use that degree for nothing, you know. So, you know, just because that's what you said you wanted to be when you went to school, that doesn't mean that's what you got to do. Don't, no. don't be disappointed or feel like we're going to be disappointed. Yeah, you said you didn't wouldn't go to work for Bob for crying out loud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, uh, didn't work out. That didn't work out. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> Never. Yeah. yeah, it's a strong word. Yeah, well, kids, kids are fun. Kids are fun. It, it's been. Everybody says it goes by quick. It does. It does. I mean, it, it goes fast, but it's been a blast. Uh, the kids are a lot of fun, and now they're you know in a different place in their life. But I, I still have a blast with them. A lot of fun with them. I love going helping Hallie and. Watching her grow and become and who she's And she brings become. some guy home that's throwing up <laughs> in the front yard. <laughs> some rough <laughs> puking in the yard. <laughs> puking in the yard. Like, oh, really? Wow, this uh, is going to I've seen this episode. Out. Yeah. <laughs> so, she, so she went to the prom this year. Went to the prom this year. A senior asked her to the prom. Yeah, that was uh, – I wasn't there when she went, but, you know, I got all the FaceTime and all the pictures. And, and mom sends me a picture of her. And she's got all of her makeup on and her hair done, and she's wearing this dress that slid up to here. And I'm like, <laughs> whoa. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> that can't be my daughter. Uh, she, was, <laughs> she was beautiful. But this, this kid that asked her to prom, so everybody knew, I guess. He's, he's a big baseball stud, I guess. He's one of the big best baseball players and whatnot, this big kid. And he had to... Uh, I've, I still haven't ever met him. He showed I, me a picture. He looked like he's about 32. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, some of our, our friends, they he, they know him, and they said, oh, yeah, he's a great kid and all this. Well, anyways, I guess he's been going to ask her to prom, but she's either been, she's like, you know, because she leaves early from school, like on a Wednesday, because we got to go to a rodeo, you know, to the cutting or whatnot. And he's always off playing baseball, so, like, he they keep missing each other, you know. And I guess 
the like proms on Saturday and on, I guess on maybe it was like on Monday. She, I don't know if it was after school or whatever, but anyways, he's standing out there in the parking lot and he's got this sign and he's all dressed up like redneck, like got to cut off flannel and cut off jeans and you know, all this stuff. And he, and the sign said, what did it say? I, I might not be no bull rider, but could I give you a ride to the prom or something like that? Or would you, something like that? Or would you ride with me to the prom or whatnot? And that's how he asked her to the prom. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Jethro off the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> yeah, I did show you video. Yeah. But it, it's cool, though. It's cool to see him grow up and, you know, go through all those things and experience it. Because you just, you just look back and you think, man, I, I can totally remember when I, I was I remember that, that. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it makes you feel old, that's for sure. But it's cool, though. It's it's cool. I love it. It's cool to see him grow up. I was listening to a podcast the other day with Marcus Luttrell, and I guess he's a girl dad as well. He said, I was a little worried about it for a little while. He's a Navy SEAL. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's like, I got less worried about it when I figured out that I'm going to just make sure that she knows every lie that them little bastards are going to tell her. <laughs> And martial arts. <laughs> and martial <laughs> said, arts. Yeah. He said, if they, if they make it to the front door, they're going to have earned it. <laughs> <laughs> you think about this a lot. Yes. Mm. <laughs> this, this teach your girls to be independent. I'll tell you what, they, my, my daughter's pretty independent, and she knows what she likes, and she knows what she doesn't like, and she's pretty strong in, in that. And that gives me a lot of comfort because I know that she'll be like, you know. Well, mine's got the constitution of her mother, so I think we're going to be okay. Eighty <laughs> yeah, percent. But her mother picked you. I, that's no! that's a fact. Dang it! <laughs> that Hole is a fact. in the theory. <laughs> well, it was almost perfect. It was almost. <laughs> it was almost perfect. <laughs> Dang. She's made me a lot better too. <laughs> oh my lord! Oh, that's good. That's good. I wouldn't have made thirty five if I hadn't got married. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh. So, well, this was the trajectory I was on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Before Sarah, after Sarah, right? right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, the trajectory changed a little. I don't win as much, but it's a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> But you still win. Yeah. Well, yeah. here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Doing podcasts. I mean, come on. Yeah. Well, we'll so see. We don't know that hair. this is getting recorded. Yeah, this, yeah, this, this, no we, idea. this, this, this may be three and a half hours. You're never going to get back. <laughs> yeah. I hope we can do this again. <laughs> Oh, this is going to be funny if it was not recorded. <laughs> you didn't press record, Russell? No, the well, clock I is definitely... It, but I'm so a little concerned with green means go and red means no, stop. No, I know that and that's... And we're on red. No, no, that's good. I do know that part. That's fine. I'm just... <laughs> you know, it's always... this. And for everybody's information, this is our first trial attempt without Ben sitting here at the board. So Russell and I are on our own volition here. Just because he wants to be a pilot. Yeah. And uh, so I'm people. trying to figure out how this little tiny piece of plastic is going to come out of this machine. <laughs> With all this on it. And I'm going to send it away and then you guys are going to get to hear it. Mm. Uh, it's hard to believe. Yeah, This could know. be a problem. <laughs> I did an interview one time. We should have recorded hey. this in case it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's true because I did an interview one time and it was about a 45 minute hour long interview. She asked me a ton of questions over the phone. Calls me back 10 minutes later. That um, didn't work. <laughs> my recorder didn't record. Do you oh. think we could do that again? I was like, uh. <laughs> And, you know, your answers the second time, because she would ask questions, you know. It was like she would ask me a question. And, I, and so your answers are, like, not near as good the second time. I don't know why Why it was. is that? It's just not near as good. Like, 
That's why I, I could never be do the acting gig because they make you do it over and over and over again. I'm like, yeah, the first one is yeah, the best Yeah, this one. is getting After worse. That, yeah, it's bad. What is wrong with you? Just clip it, man. Let's go on. That's all I got. Yeah, yeah, that was fun trying to do that one a second time. And now it's time for a quick thank you to our sponsors who help us bring you this awesome content. Hey, so the other day, Travis came over and sold me some Globe Life insurance. Sold my wife some Globe Life insurance, and he's a pretty good salesman, but I don't know if he's as good as my wife, <laughs> because now he's sponsoring the podcast, and he bought a whole bunch of meat. <laughs> good job, Trav. Yeah. Um, well, the good news is that it's a heck of a good uh, product that he's selling. Yeah, really good, superb. And it, the, I put the boys on it because um, they don't really have a ton of insurance, and they don't have if they don't. If I go down, Tana can do all the work. <laughs> <laughs> she does anyway. Whatever. <laughs> Ease up. <laughs> You're ruining my stature. <laughs> Take away my figurehead <laughs> status. But like so Colt like, in if, them, if she if gets they, hurt, if she gets hurt when she goes and does her Navy SEAL training, yeah. <laughs> this is gonna I get cut, paid. You're gonna get paid. <laughs> That's outstanding. And but they didn't pay you anything for your tooth. I was a little, yeah. yeah. They didn't. I timing, didn't timing get. Was I went, bad. Timing the timing was bad. was bad. I knocked it out before mm. I got it. That's Just it. like your employee, yeah, who Stephen, didn't yeah. get it. Stefan didn't get it. He had the option to get it, didn't get it. Got hurt two weeks out. And I, <laughs> had to haul some extra horses to Arizona. Well, you guys check them out. Uh, you can find them at the thomasagencies.com and also at globewifeinsurance.com. So check that out and talk to Travis or Linda. And uh, yeah, it's, it's Every darn from, sure. And darn it's sure not worth. just injury either. No. It's for uh, sickness, cancer, all of it. Yep. There's just a list there, and you get to look at the prices, how much you get paid back, and then. The beauty is, if you go 20 or 25 years and you don't have anything wrong, they give you all the money back that you paid. All of it. Yeah, so that's crazy right It's like right a savings there. account. Yep, yep, beautiful savings so account. So it's great if you're accident prone and also great if you're not. Yeah, exactly, double. That's a win-win. I know. Yeah. So hook it up with them. Call For Travis. Sure. And yeah, and it pays you know, on top of your insurance. Yeah, that, what you, have, you can patient. have the greatest insurance in the world, still get it, it still pays more on top. It's irrelevant what you're already getting. So once again, you can check them out, thethomasagencies.com. Hey, we got to throw back real quick because that just brought to mind that there was a <laughs> video that I saw. It's been a minute ago. I'm pretty sure. I don't think this video is available for public watching. <laughs> Good. I feel like. <laughs> I feel like. I think there was something about the village people involved. Yeah. There probably is. I don't think they had video cameras back then. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have phones. <laughs> Good thing. <laughs> You're just going to have to give them a, I, I, a recap. I still have a picture. It's in my office. It is. I have a frame picture in my office. So, yeah. So, when... Uh, Sun Circuit, Scottsdale, Arizona. You know, that show's always been huge or whatnot. But this is when I lived down in Arizona and stuff. Anyways, <clears throat> they had, used to always have a – I think they might have started it again, but they after our couple of years, they had to shut her down. But uh, they had a big exhibitor party and whatnot, and then they would have uh, – uh, I guess you would call it lip sync, big lip sync production with all the trainers and we took it pretty seriously like you rehearsed like you met beforehand like weeks before and rehearsed and figured out what your act was going to be and uh yeah so me so myself john slack craig schmersel and del hendrix so we were all doing the raining right so we were the rainers down there in arizona we were the village people. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say we brought the house down. <laughs> but let's say there was a lot of liquid encouragement <laughs> involved to get us all to do it. There was several acts that year. There was a lot of acts. 
but and there was a lot of very very intoxicated people <laughs> <laughs> and uh so we do our act and we're the we're the closing act okay they're bringing in the village people we're we're gonna close her down and knock it out of the park right so we do our deal we got the whole crowd going we're up on stage there's a full stage there we were over at uh where did they do that at rawhide uh, i don't know but anyways this big deal right there close by and uh, so we're up there on stage and the whole deal and and we kind of get done and then it just turns into this big melee of dancing and everybody's <laughs> dancing. All the other acts are out there dancing and music's going and Dale Hendricks. Pandemonium. Yeah, it's pandemonium. And like Dale Hendricks mob. decides to jump off the stage. Oh my and Lord. So he jumps off the stage and he lands and he goes down and we're like, Oh, Dale went down. We're all laughing at him. Oh, look at Dale. And he's rolling around, and and uh, so then we're all down there, and nobody's real concerned, but he's still not getting up. <laughs> and we're like, "Come on, Dale, get up!" And we're like dragging him up, you know. And and he's he's very intoxicated. And we kind of get him up, and he's like, "No, I think I hurt myself." And we're like, "Yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah, right. whatever." <laughs> and so it gets all done, and we drag him to the back, and we're all going in the back, take our costumes off and stuff. Well, he's hurting. Like, he's his feet are hurting him bad. So he ends up getting hauled off to the Catch emergency. Me. He gets hauled off to the emergency room with uh, two broken heels. Oh. <laughs> Splits both of his heels. He shows up the next day at the horse show, both legs in a cast. <laughs> So leap of faith. Yo, no yeah. one is there to catch him. And there is a video because we had an after party and we watched all the acts and then we watched Dell and we slow mo it. Now that you say that, I do remember. There and Dell jumps off the stage and the stage was only about four and a half feet high. It wasn't a big tall stage, so it wasn't that big of a leap, right? Uh huh. But he jumps and he lands. That's like, a lot of man. But he lands like. We're like straight legged. Straight legged. Straight legged. <laughs> We're like Dell. You gotta Whoa. bend your knees. He didn't bend his knees at all. He just like dunk. I mean, just and nothing. And then down he goes, <laughs> breaks both of his heels. <laughs> Comes out the next day. Can't show his horses. There he is on a golf cart in a pair of shorts <laughs> and two casts from the knee down. <laughs> Well, no one remembers the show, the no, uh, horse no. show, anyways. But the village no. people, the village people, forever. we were awesome. Yeah. yeah, we were awesome. But yeah, so I think it might have been after that year <laughs> that they decided maybe they shouldn't have that party <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Just build a shorter stage. <laughs> oh yeah, it was yeah. But I st I do have that picture. Yeah, it's framed in my office now that you say that. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I'm trying to think of who was who. Uh, Dell was the policeman. He, <laughs> John was the Indian. What was Craig? Craig was the biker dude. He yeah. had on shaps and the vest and the whole deal, and I was the construction worker. <laughs> yeah. It was, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. You bet. You bet. I've <laughs> been waiting four hours and 20 minutes for that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was good times. But, yeah, I think they shut her down after that because too many injuries, too many intoxicated <laughs> <one>. people. <laughs> I bet there was others. Uh, yeah, I maybe. think there was. That Sun Circuit, there's uh, – it's a breeding ground of bad decisions. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't no joke. Yeah. When you put that many people in sunny Arizona for 10 days, yeah. Stuff's going to happen. Stuff's going to happen. I have not drank Fireball since last time I went to the Sun Circuit. Oh, I hate cinnamon. <laughs> God, that Corey Cushing will get you in trouble. He is yeah. horrible. Yeah. Ruined my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of good memories living down there in Arizona. I was there for three years, I think. So you and John had 
equine enterprise and that was yeah called? so when we left stone ranch yeah we just went down the road and and just we me and him stayed in business together so we were 50 50 owners of yeah and we named it equine enterprise and and uh chuck blair stephanie's dad he kind of helped us get it set up business wise you know how to set that all up and how to do it and we had us a secretary and we had us a barn full of horses and the way we went, you know, and we had we had some good years there, some really good years. Did well. I won a reigning fraternity. He won a reigning fraternity. I was reserve. The year he won it, I was reserve. That's yeah, cool. so we went one, two at that reigning fraternity that year. So for two young guys getting started and doing the deal, that was, that was a pretty awesome night. So I'll tell you a little story on that. So we go, we go. We win the reigning fraternity, right? He wins it. I'm second. I mean, how, it can't get much better than that, you know? I right. mean, and we're we're in business together, and we're doing this deal. And anyways, we're, uh, you know, you get all done with that night, and I mean, good Lord, you're tired, and who wants to pack up and go home, you know? And, right. What's the point? Yeah. So... We've got a guy that's hauled, hauling horses for us too. He's helping us with the hauling because uh, we needed, you know, a couple of rigs and whatnot. And so he would always take care of all that stuff for us. And so that night he goes, "Hey guys, there's a there's some weather coming in through Flagstaff because we'd have to go through Flag, you know, and then drop down to Phoenix." And he's like, "There's some weather coming in there. We might ought to just wait it out a day, and it'll pass through, and then we'll be." we'll be good to go home we're like we're all about that you know <laughs> we're, we're not we're not wanting to just get up and pack it up and go home so you know we sleep in a little bit and then we we pack all the stuff and everything get everything ready but then we're not going to leave till the next day so uh we do that and we head out and we're headed across 40 there you know and he's checking weather and we're watching that well we get just outside of outside of flag maybe to winslow maybe and it is dumping it's storming well the storm kind of hung up in flagstaff that day before and hasn't really made its way out of there and so we're driving right into the grunt of it so our big plan kind of backfired on us and so we're pulled over there in Winslow because the road shut down, the semis, you know, jackknifed or something, and we're just sitting there in this truck stop, and it's snowing like crazy. Big old town. Yeah, and we sit there for hours waiting for them to open the highway, and in the time that we're sitting there, it gets dark, so the temperature drops, and now Ooh. it's really storming. And, I mean, the snow is piling up, but they, they open the highway back up, so we're like, must be good to go, you know, and – so we just get going and uh i'm driving because john never drove and he, he and i well i didn't want him to drive it was, it was a little a little scary because when he's playing air guitar and the drums while he's driving because he loved to listen to music i was always a little nervous so anyways i'm like i'll drive and uh so <clears throat> we get into flag and it's getting pretty dicey it's not good and we drop down onto 17 and uh we're just inching our way along we're going about 10 mile an hour because it's no packed roads and it's icy and it's bad and we're not chained up and this car in front of me starts spinning out and I'm like, oh no! And so I let off, and second I let off, it's here it comes. It starts to wiggle, and that guy kind of gets it straightened out. So I get back on the gas, and I get her straightened out, and we're going along. Well, then he starts spinning out again. Well, now he does the big 360, and I got to oh. let off, and I'm trying to move over. For, you know, long story short, I jackknifed that son of a gun right, <laughs> right, and and but I'm going like 10 mile an hour. I'm barely going. And I'm driving, John's in the passenger seat, and Andrea Fapani has, was working for us at the time, and he's in the back seat. And I can see this trailer coming, and I got the wheels turned, and I'm on the gas trying to get her straight, and it's nothing's, nothing's happening. happening. And, and I'm just like, hang on, boys, here comes the trailer. And Andrea, he was behind me, and it's coming my way. 
he jumps over to the other side and this trailer comes around and I jackknife it and it pops the back window out and the pass or the, and the window behind me out, you know, it's a crew, crew cab yeah. dually pops both those windows out. The glass just explodes and goes everywhere. And there I am sitting all the way across the highway <laughs> all the way. <laughs> and I'm looking out my door and traffic is coming to me. And I'm like, I got to get out of here. Like, cause they're going to crash right they're, into me, right. but I can't open my door cause we're jackknifed and it's kind of got the cab kind of messed up a little bit. And there's just enough room that they can get onto the shoulder and get by me, but like it's tight and they don't want to slow down. They just want to keep going. So everybody's going around me. So we all crawl out John's side and there we are. Well, I, <laughs> Last night, we just went one, two at the fraternity. We're like, today, here we sit. And here we are on the here today. We're standing on the side of the freeway with a jackknife rig, looking at each other, going, Now, what do we do? And I looked at John and I'm like, God, last night we were heroes. Now, look at us. You know, we're just a bunch of idiots sitting on the side of the road. So, this sport is very humbling. Yeah. So we got we got towed out of there and we made it home and we had on our jackets and our stocking caps and our leather gloves and because I mean it was cold because there's no windows in this thing and we had to drive it two hours down to Phoenix you know yeah that was our trip after we went one two at the fraternity <laughs> yeah that was quite the night needless to say it. It was supposed to take us, I think, from Oklahoma City to Phoenix is like 16 hours, 15 hours maybe. It took us like 24 <laughs> We by the time we made it home. Mm. Those kind of trips. Yeah, oh, it was. But I'll never, I will never forget that. Just being at the top of the world. And, and then, then the next day we're. Trying to stay alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, the things we do, huh? I mean, the places we've been and the experiences that we've had going up and down that road. Mm. And believe me, I've been up and down the road living in Oregon and showing it all this stuff. Like I was telling somebody, I said, this year, you know, because I, I came back here in September and I was just going to stay through the American and then go back home. Yeah. Because I was helping out with the American and I wanted to get through those early shows just because I can prepare better down here. Because up there, there's just nothing going on and you know that time of year and can't get hardly get any cattle. And it's, I'm stuck in my little indoor arena. And I just never, ever, ever feel prepared, you mm -hmm. know, when I come back for those early shows. And uh, so I'm just going to stay down through all that. And then I'm going to go home and, you know, business as usual. But in the meantime, one of the guys that used to work for me ended up leasing my place from me. So barn was full and... He's leasing the place and paying us to be there and stuff. Nice. So I decided just to stay here. But uh, but I was telling somebody, I was like, at this time in all the years past, I would have already have drove to Texas and back like three times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, this year I've been to twice as many shows, and I think the furthest I drove, well, I know the furthest I drove was to Vegas. Right. But I went to all kinds of shows out here, and I like slept in my own bed every night, and I was like, it just was weird. It just seemed so weird to me. Like I don't feel like I've even done anything. I haven't even tried. I mean, yeah, I'm I, not trying. <laughs> this it, is not hard yeah, enough. It felt it felt weird not to, you know. But well, yeah. well, like on your way to town, you could like, you know, go to Nebraska. <laughs> 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 yeah. You could just come right out here and hit 281 yeah, and run it up. Keep north. going, yeah. I mean, if just a little stretch. You could just run like Lawton, Oklahoma City, back down 35 yeah. to Fort Worth yeah. just to make you, you know. Yeah, make me feel like I was doing uh, something. The driving yeah. used the, to be. The driving is, yeah, it, I'll tell you what, it, it, it's burnt me out. Yeah. It, it has. It, uh, you know, my dad drove for me for a while there. I would send him and my help. Um, my dad would. You know, he's just like, hey, if you need some help and whatever. And and so I took him up on it for a lot of years there. And he used to drive. And like any of the shows back here, I would just fly in. You know, I'd send my help mm -hmm. <clears throat> with the horses and him. And and uh, I would fly in. And, man, that was just 
because by the time I would drive to a show and then drive back, that's a week, mm-hmm. a whole nother week. Cause mm-hmm. it's two and a half days for me to get home, you know? And, uh, it, I just, you add that up over the years and <laughs> man, it, it, it did. It burnt me out those last few years. It's, it was getting harder and harder and harder to get in that truck and drive. It really was. And the part where it got really hard for me was, excuse me, when my kids were a little younger, that got really hard because I'm like, yeah, I got to I gotta go again, you know? And I'm like, I'd really like to stay and, you know, go to the basketball game or, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like that. And, and it, it kind of burnt me out there for a while. And, um, it's just funny how this whole deal with, with Teton Ridge kind of came about, too, because I was kind of getting to that point where I was getting burnt out of showing. I still love training. I love training. I love, you know, well, you've heard me talk all night, but but the showing, it just it was almost becoming, like, more work than enjoyment or what I wanted, you know. Mm-hmm. and I was getting super burnt out on it, and I was wanting to slow down a little bit and not ride so much, and I've had some soundness issues, whatever you want to call them, and that I've have struggled with and fought with for a lot of years, and uh, a couple of years ago, uh, my back was getting bad, and, and I'm trying to get ready for World's Greatest, and and, man, I am... There's something going on in my back, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And, like, pretty soon I can't put my boots on, and it's getting, like, it's getting very, very painful. And uh, then one day I'm, like, I'm riding, but I'm not riding very good because I'm protecting my back. And anyways, then it just, like, really went. And, like, to the point, like, I can't ride. I can't get on i can't put my clothes on <clears throat> and it's like i have the trailer packed like we're leaving tomorrow morning and my wife's like you are not going you there's no way i mean and i was it was painful enough and crippling enough i'm like yep you're right you're right i can't go and i was really really disappointed because the year before was my first year of showing my stud smartly starstruck at the world's greatest. And I, and I was fourth and I had a good showing and I really believed in that horse. And so the next year I felt like this is his year, you know, because mm-hmm. I did it the one year and he, and it went well and he was good, but I've got a whole nother year on him and he's more experienced. And I, and I had, I felt good about going. I was, you know, I'd done everything. I'd done my homework. I had them prepared. I had them ready, and I had to scratch. Mm. And I couldn't make it back here, and I had to scratch. And that was – I had never – I've had to scratch a couple horses over the years because they came up lame or something that I really wanted to show. But I, that one was pretty hard mm. for me to scratch. And my wife's just like, you're not going. And – I finally gave in and said, okay, I'm not going. And so I scratched everything and, you know, had to call my customers and tell them I'm not going because I'm crippled. Your horse is fine, but I'm crippled. (laughs) And so I get into the doctor and get an MRI and I've got a herniated disc in my lower back that is getting ready to rupture. Like it's got a pretty significant tear in it. And like, it's getting ready to go. And, uh, I'm just like, so what do we do? And they're like, well, one, no horse riding. (laughs) They're like, you gotta, you gotta lay low (laughs) that you can't be doing anything because if that thing ruptures, then you're screwed. And then we got to do surgery and then we got to replace the disc and all this stuff. Mm. And, uh, so they're like, let's do this and this and you lay low and then we'll come back and look at it. in I don't remember what it was a couple weeks and let's see what it's doing, you know? And if it's not getting any better, then we're going to have to do some surgery of some sort, you know? Anyways, 
long story short, it was getting better. But while I am, so that that week that I'm supposed to be gone, the only place I could really get comfortable is laying on a massage table. So face down, but it's, you know how a massage table has mm-hmm. a little deal that you put your hole. face in it, you know, so your body's just completely flat. Yep. That was the only place I could get comfortable. We had a massage table at home. We used, uh, we used to have a gal come to the house. My wife has a bad back, and so she was getting massages all the time, so we bought a table just so that gal could just show up and give her a massage and whatnot. Anyways, so that's what we had the table. So I put it in the living room, and... So I could have the TV on and I could listen to the TV. <laughs> I was just gonna say, but I can't you watch can't it. See it. I can't watch it. But I'd put my phone down on the floor, and I would lay on my back, and my wife would put heating pad and then ice, heating pad and ice, and do that. And that's I just lay there all day because I mean, I don't know if you've ever lay on your belly. Yeah, lay on my belly. Yeah, but like if I did something when I had that bad disc, if I did something just wrong and I hit it just right. It felt, honest to God, felt like somebody just stuck a cattle prod <sighs> right up my butt. I mean, it would drop me, like drop me to the ground. And like the one day I went outside and we have a fireplace and we've got a wood box next to the fireplace, but it's got a door on the outside also. Mm. And so you can just load the wood from the outside yeah. into the wood box. And so then when you're building your fire, you just open that door and you can just throw your wood in there, right? So you don't have to drag it in the house. Anyways, so I'm outside and I'm throwing some wood in the wood box. And I just just bent over and picked one up to do it. And it hit me. And down I go. And it's raining outside. And I'm laying out on the patio (laughs) like completely crippled. It's raining. Invalid. (laughs) <laughs> and exactly. And my kids looking out the window going, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, wife alert. Yeah. Wife alert. Yeah. I've fallen and I cannot I get, up. get up. <laughs> and they have to come help me. Seriously, have to come help me get up. I mean, that's how crippling it was. And that happened several times. I was in the ba- in the in our uh, closet one time getting dressed. And I just went to put my leg in a pair of jeans. And, and down I go. And I'm uh, screaming and. Missy comes running back there, and there I am laying there, you know. But it's just when you would hit it just right. Just it, oh. an odd, and then you're always worried about it. For sure, you're worried about it. Because I, I have never in my life experienced that. I It, whoa, man. So anyways, so I'm laying there on that massage table, <laughs> face down, and my phone rings. And guess who it is? Thomas Toll. And presents this whole thing to me. And he goes, I want you to be a part of all this. And I'm like. Yep, sounds good. Whoa, this is. I've never had one of those Obviously, moments. this isn't FaceTime. <laughs> no, <'cause> you, would, <laughs> you, you would see what you're buying. I'm like, <laughs> Did he do a pre-purchase on you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have been. I don't think Joe would have passed you. <laughs> My little cheek sticking out. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> oh. <laughs> But it was so weird because I'm laying there completely depressed because I have to miss this show. I felt like I had my horse ready. And I'm depressed. I really am. I was mm-hmm. not in a good mood. I was that was one of the hardest things I've done. And and I'm just, you know, is this it? Is this the end of me? <laughs> is this the end of my career? I'm having to scratch shows because I can't ride now. I I can't even put my own pants on right now. I mean, you know, I'm and I'm seriously, all this is going through my head. You know, I'm like, not why I wanted to be naked today. <laughs> There's better reasons. I hope the cable guy doesn't show up. <laughs> here I am naked on my massage table. <laughs> and nobody's plug, here. Plug that in anywhere. Could you give me a seven up? <laughs> <laughs> with a straw yeah <laughs> yeah but i'm thinking that in my head i'm just like i'm depressed you know i'm like yeah ah, this um, this is horrible am, am i done do i gotta come up with something else to do because this is like the third time this has happened now you know and oh. 
And uh, anyways, and then that's who calls me. And I'm like, this is just so weird. And this sounded so great. And I'm like, this is exactly what I've been kind My of way out. looking for, you know, is something like this. So I don't have to ride as many horses because they want me to be involved in some other stuff. And, you know, they're still going to allow me to ride other horses. Right. But mm -hmm. anyway, so yeah, I was, I was all in, you know, I'm like, heck yeah, this sounds great to me. And long story short, you know, flew back here and had some meetings and met him and found out more about it. And, you know, and then it just kept going from there and everything. But, uh, no, it was kind of weird how it all came about and the timing of it. It really was. The timing was what still to this day, I'm kind of like, mm. that was just kind of weird how that, how that happened right then and there, you know? So hopefully this deal just keeps going and growing and, and, uh, turns out to what we all want it to be, you know, but, um, I think it'll be pretty cool if we can, if we can get it to where we want it to be, you know, but like I say, it's, it's the maiden voyage of something like this. So, you know, it's, it's going to take a little bit to get it going and figure out how to organize it all and how to make it all work. And I mean, we've already changed things and did some different things that we thought we were going to do and all that, you know, but that's just, to me, that's anytime you set up anything new, right. You know, it's going to take a little Always. bit. And so one time, me and I, you probably don't remember, but it was at Pastor Robles again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're talking about stuff. Mm -hmm. And I said something about getting the cow horse on TV. And you're like, I don't know. You know, it's so intense. There's so much to it. I don't know if the outside world can grasp appreciate the beauty it. of it and yeah. appreciate, appreciate it. it. And yeah. I said, Todd, poker is king right now <laughs> yeah right. yeah it's yeah we have the event it's dead it's now just, and it's still on tv it's yeah. still yeah. huge it's still 12 hours a day huge, yeah. huge, huge it is yeah poker yeah they got us to watch yeah poker it's just a presentation yeah and and and, and, that, and it is the pre you said it right. it's the presentation yeah that's the first step in the presentation mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. first time i saw poker wasn't the first time they tried it yeah like <laughs> yeah. they went through it a few times before right. it hit the networks right. and went through the roof right that's just the way right. it goes yeah and golf yeah i mean yeah. for crying out loud Go to the golf course and sit and watch golf. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't work. No. But it's on TV mm -hmm. all day, mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. No, and and I and, and you're absolutely right. I think there's we have a lot to offer, you know, and and not and I'm not talking just cow horse, but just the horse world in general. Mm -hmm. You know, and and that's the thing that that we want to uh open the eyes you know of the general public to is is the stories the the relationship with the horses the stories of the horses the stories of the riders you know and stuff like that because when you can hit people on a on a personal level like that i think that grasps anybody mm -hmm. you know it it you don't have to even be a fan of cow horse or cutting or raining or anything but just those stories that the journeys and you know and just let people in on all that stuff that we live every day you know i think you i think you could you could create a pretty good following yeah oh that, I know that's what can. shocked us we're doing this deal mm -hmm. i mean absolutely it shocked us because i mean this was just a fluke right thing and like it's not like we're making any <laughs> money <self>. here <laughs> but it's but it's been so amazing to me how many how much feedback we get mm -hmm. and it's how crazy. much and how uh, probably our biggest compliment is that people uh, we've heard that like their significant others that are not involved mm -hmm. at all are okay if they listen to this in the truck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I mean, now that's a raving review, but yeah. but it is right because I mean, if you're listening to something that you're interested in that your wife is not, mm -hmm. you ain't listening to that in the mm -hmm. truck, mm -hmm. right? Ain't happening. Yeah. And so it it, it really. Well, you just know, don't you, have as much control over yours as I, I do. I don't. Yeah, no. Yeah, you keep telling yourself that big guy. <laughs> Can't wait for her to come back from that Navy SEALs training and whip you into shape. She'll knock your other tooth out. <laughs> yeah, so those of us that you can't see what we're looking at, 
<laughs> that is no small gap. <laughs> I always get my thumb in there. <laughs> Well, it's better. I think it's better that it's just gone all the time, Todd. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. was it who was it? Matt Mills, wherever you're, Matt, and you kept like <laughs> dropping it in and out. And this Matt, but it's fun and, to mess with people though, because one second they you see it, and then the next second out, they're like going, "What? Wait a minute." No, was that not there all the whole had time? A tooth. <laughs> Matt, no, he didn't have a tooth. Yeah, he did. It's there. <laughs> Yeah. I've gotten Matt Mills dot com broke our broke our podcast too. Yeah. <laughs> we dropped him. Did we tell you that story? Uh-uh. We're at the American. We interview right. him there in our athletes' village. Right. We drop it. We get about five hundred listens in about two hours, and our podcast vanishes from the world. No, gone. Yeah. Every it was gone. Hacked Dude. us. Ben says we got hacked. You know, I was like. Why? No, we're not Why making. Would they, they can't. Us? There's nothing to <laughs> steal. We us? have made no Who wants money. One tooth guy, <laughs> like bald, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we have been stolen. <laughs> and anyway, that's why now everybody's having to resubscribe to our deal. Yeah, because even I, I didn't. I mean, like, yeah, it was very confusing for me. Somebody showed me if you just turn it off and start it again, they all come back. Hmm. Yeah, but oh, anyway, no. but yeah, that was. But yeah, so Matt, was Matt Mills broke our broke <laughs> broke our <laughs> Matt podcast. Broke it. <laughs> Dang. Just no. like my tooth. <laughs> that ben was your wife, me. though. My wife makes fun of me so much. I'm so tired of it. Ben Bla- <laughs> blames it on bad wife. It was my anniversary. <laughs> I broke it off in our. This is why I get for 29 years of commitment. <laughs> <laughs> she knocked her tooth out. <laughs> Oh, Brussels sprout, dude. But beside the point, I was with her. <laughs> He's been getting a. I I'm, get, I I'm getting my grasp uh, on my lisp. You are. <laughs> now the listeners can be like, "Who's the new guy talking?" <laughs> <Who's the new laughs> guy? Oh, that's Russell. <laughs> got a lisp but the, now. Huh? He's got a lisp now. But my tooth. Look how much goes with that little bee tooth. It's like a spade bit. That, it's like a spade. <laughs> <laughs> it's exhausting. Now show him how you would drop it in and out while talking. You know like <laughs> Steph Curry? Yeah. <laughs> Chews on a single. Yeah. You know? <laughs> this is where the show starts to go downhill. <laughs> hey, and those little hooks are... <laughs> He's slurping on he his is, retainer. He's having to wipe the drool off. It's yeah. unavoidable. <laughs> Those little hooks, if hey, you get them in the wrong place, and there they are. You got to get more teeth knocked out if you want to be like Casey Deary and Rand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he lost all his front teeth. Yeah. That's why I'm not good at raining. <laughs> <laughs> now you tell me. I think I'm just going to let it go. Oh. <laughs> uh, mm. Well, at, at risk of being cliche, I, to honor your time, we should probably let you go. We are only 10 minutes shy of five hours. Though. Well, don't take that long to wrap up. I got to get this really? thing out We've of my Really? We've been talking guns. that long? Mm. Holy cow. We, uh, and we, I mean, we haven't had a break. No. That's uh, that's shocking for me because I usually have a bladder problem before we get to this point. <laughs> like tonight. a lady, <laughs> I haven't cracked that seal though. <laughs> but we would be remiss. Once because, you start peeing, you just have you, to keep yeah, going. Oh, I know. Quit. Well, I get on that settling, get on the settling rotation and so settling. It, yeah, like for herds. Mm. So it's oh, like, settling. It's like. <laughs> Every 40 minutes. I was thinking yeah. it's settling and oxygen. Well, how in the hell is that? Not, not acetylene. <laughs> Who's got the lisp? <laughs> I'm not making... Put I live in Texas. I don't live in Paul's Valley. <laughs> I'm not making methamphetamines at my house. So I'm not acetylene in Paul's Valley. No one's per- in Paul's Valley. Wherever. Winnie would. Oh, yeah. Winnie Winnie home of... wouldn't. Any- home. <laughs> <laughs> home of Joe Exotic. No longer. Mm-hmm. No longer? It You've been to visit him? Prison. Have you been to visit him? I have to enunciate with this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Work on my... <laughs> Is that your gold one? Is that your dress one? Or no? no it's a little dark. I want to get a gold one so bad. Just a word of town. 
Screw it in on the weekends. <laughs> I want one with the Screw little. It in on the weekends. <laughs> I want one with the diamond, one with the ruby, Bed- and one bedazzle with the emerald. It. Yeah, bedazzle it. Yeah. yeah, and then just a plain white one for work. <laughs> Plain white tea yeah. for work. <laughs> but a gold one with a diamond for the finals. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know what you're getting if you hire Russell to do some commentating. Yeah. She, you can be you can be selling merch at the shows. I told the the whatever the orthopedic surgeon was, I said, Hey, I want more than one tooth. Hey, and he said, I'm out. working on your He's, bones. He said, are you joking? <laughs> I've never thought of that. I said, well, because you can get the one that you screw the stob in and then they glue it on there. Right. Or you get one that they just put a screw through it into the, because they put titanium into right. my Into the thing, bone. My yeah. bone. It's like, holy mackerel. I said, yeah, I want to go disco. Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> we need a ruby. <laughs> now I want to go slumming. We need the emerald. We'll go the finals, diamond. <laughs> but it's gold all the way around. <laughs> then give me a white tooth for business meetings. <laughs> well, you do have a little bit of a lisp, though, with when you put it in. I, mean, I, I think it's you. worse. It is. <laughs> it's worse when you got it in. There is. It's like having a spade bit. I'm not kidding. <laughs> God, put, do you remember when they called? Did you hear the story when they called Van Snow to announce the gay rodeo? Oh no! Oh my goodness! I wish I knew the story better. We'll have to ask. <laughs> no, no, tell it. But, Make it up. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, well, he had a little bit of a lisp, and mm-hmm. I don't remember if somebody was jacking with him. But I don't think it. Well, I don't think they were. I feel like it was a legitimate. Tucker deal. Robinson won one. I could believe that. He's got buckle. <laughs> won a gay rodeo. Yep. Oh. Okay. Team roping. <laughs> I can almost remember who he was roping with. Well, I feel have. like it could be a snow now that we're having this conversation. <laughs> with Cody? No, it probably wasn't. Cody's way Co- younger than him. Yeah. Trying to buy some steers from Cody. This is going to hurt that price. <laughs> <laughs> Russell, I'm so glad you came down today. And if you need anything for your horses, we can run down just right down the road right here in Weatherford and uh, stop by Santa Cruz Animal Health and pick up anything you might have forgotten at home. Any grooming products, you need your horses vaccinated, like you want to be careful when you're out. I know you haven't been showing that much because you've been judging. And so like before you go get on the road, you might want to vaccinate your horses and you can get those vaccines. I know you're an anti-vaxxer, but... (laughs) When it comes to your horses, we need to just conform. You need to believe. You need to believe. And so you can get that right down here at Santa Cruz Animal Health, just right down the street. Sweet. I need to pick up some of that Ultra Cruise brand product line to help make my horses pop when I get in that show ring. Finally, just. You do. You need a just, little help. Just you need a little, a little help. help. Your, your ranch lifestyle needs a little. If I could leave my hat off, I could use my shiny bald head, but I can't. So I've got to <laughs> spark them horses up. Well, like I say, if you guys are on the north side of Weatherford, uh, right on 1885, you can stop in at their uh, lovely little store right there in Weatherford, right along with the San Juan Ranch. If you want to stop in there, look at some of them lovely colts they're raising there as well. It's a one-stop shop. Nice. And if you just happen to be on the other side of the nation, out by the ocean, and Bass Robles have got an outlet there, too. Uh, well, we would be remiss because our... we. One of our most frequently asked questions from listeners is about mental preparation for show day. Uh-huh. And so... I think it's mental health. Mental health as well. <laughs> mental health awareness. <laughs> Brother check-in. Yeah. So do you have any things, rituals? Well... How do you get yourself where you need to be there? I, I really don't, but here's, here's what I... Sound like Sarah Dawson tell people is so i always ask people i said do you get nervous before you show and everybody's like oh yeah i get nervous and they're like don't you get nervous and i said i used to but i said i don't get nervous anymore but my adrenaline gets going i said because it's competition right but to me there's a difference in nervous and your adrenaline or you're getting pumped up to show and here's how I always looked at it. 
whenever I get nervous, to me, it's a different feeling. And when I get nervous, it's because I'm uncertain. And uncertainty comes from lack of preparation. See where I'm going? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so when I was younger, I used to get very nervous. But... I always was uncertain of my ability and uncertain of my horse. And, you know, I just hadn't done it enough and whatnot. And so as I've gotten older, shown more and stuff like that, I felt like my nervousness went away. My adrenaline still stayed up and whatnot, but I felt more in control, I guess, of what I was going to go do. And, Excuse me. And to this day, if I get nervous, I know that I'm like, mm, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't be here because I'm not probably ready. And that's what makes me nervous. But, but I, my adrenaline gets going, but I think that's good. I think that's good to me. If your adrenaline doesn't get going before you show, you're done. You don't care. Yeah. Right. You're just going in and going through the motions, so you probably shouldn't be showing anyways. And I've always said that. I said, once my adrenaline quits going when I show, I need to quit because I obviously don't care. But me, for my, for my mental preparation, and I think this is a really interesting subject, and I've had this discussion with other trainers and other people or whatnot, everybody gets their mind in a different place before they go show, Right. Um, I know my buddy Tom McCutcheon, he's always talked about it, and he says he has to back himself in the corner and tell himself how terrible he is, how bad he is, or whatever, because that'll make him want to fight and go do it. And I'm the complete opposite. I got to get myself in the position of, you're a badass, you're good, you can do this. Go show these guys how it's done. Let's go do it. So I think it's interesting how, you know, we've both shown about the same amount of years and whatnot. He backs himself in a corner, so it makes him want to fight more. But for me, I'm the opposite. I got to, I got to, like, pump myself up like, you're good. No, I'm saying. You know, you're good. Be confident. You can do this. You're, you know, those guys aren't better than you, you know, and that's just just your mindset and, and how you go. Um, and I think for me, it's because I a lot of times don't trust myself or don't trust my training, even though I might be very prepared and very ready. And then I'll show a little tentatively. Mm. But if I walk in there and I'm like, got myself pumped up, like nobody can beat you. Nobody's going to beat me and you go in there and do it like that, I'm always better. So for me, that's that's what I do. But I know a lot of people, and, and I think everybody's different. A lot of people have, some people have trouble controlling their emotions or controlling their themselves to get ready to show, and they get too amped up or or too nervous or whatever, you know. But But for me, I guess what I would would tell people is I just I and and I and I've I and I've always done it and I know it's hard for some people but I just I completely block out everything around me and and I always have and I just get in my own world and I just go do my deal and I've and I've visualized it in my head a million times and I know what I got to do and I just put myself in my own world, and I go do it like there's nobody else out there. There's nobody in the Coliseum. There's no judges. There's nobody watching me. Just go do it. And that's, that's for me, how when I was younger, because my dad used to put me in way over my head. <laughs> he used to make me show way above my level. You know, I remember being 13 and showing in the open classes, you know, and – at that point in time, I didn't understand why he, why would you do that to this kid? <laughs> why are you doing this to me? I don't, but, but he was, he was, I feel like he was preparing me or, or, uh, creating in me that, you know, being able to handle high pressure situations and, you know, get, get in over your head and deal with it, you know, 
figure out how to how to do it and whatnot. So for me, that's that's where I go, you know. And like I know people, they'll they'll go in and show, and they're like, they can tell you everything about the crowd. And <laughs> I can't. I couldn't tell you what song was playing. I couldn't tell you if it was loud or it was quiet. I really nowadays I maybe so more, you know, because I've I've been there a lot and 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 I'm much more comfortable being in there. But in, in early days and stuff, I couldn't tell you if anybody was cheering for me or not, you know? I mean, I I really couldn't cuz I would just zone it out and just get in my own world and pump myself up like right. like you got, you know, and nobody's going to beat you. Just go in there and do it, you know, and that's how I would get myself. But I do, I do tell people that if you're getting nervous, you need to prepare more. Yeah. Because, because to me, nervousness comes from uncertainty. Sure. And if you're uncertain, that means <clears throat> to me, in my mind, I'm not ready. Right. I'm not prepared. Well, that's, I think you said it earlier too, and you're talking about the commentating and they're just going to throw it to you and you just got to be on the spot mm-hmm. and then that, you get nervous because mm-hmm. You haven't been in that situation. Mm-hmm. I know I haven't, and that's, mm-hmm. man, I don't know how I'm going to respond right. to what gets thrown at me right here. Right. I mean, I told Chris, that's why I told Chris up there in Kansas City the other day, he was working his cow, military guy. And, I mean, he is trying real hard, Yeah. right? And he gets done working his cow or attempting to, and I'm like, would you be intimidated if – I was to come at you in a threatening manner right now. Yeah. And he's like, no. <laughs> I said, you could have. And he would not be. He would, he would not be. <laughs> no. And he, he, it's like, you could have taken a little longer to answer. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'm like, well, that's kind of the way I think about when that cow comes out. Mm-hmm. Like, maybe my horse isn't going to respond the way I want him to. But I know where I need to go Yeah, in this situation. I'm like... If I'm going to come at you right now in a threatening manner, you know what you're going to do to counteract what anything that I can throw at you. Mm-hmm. And he kind of was like, huh. I'm like, how would, if you'd have been in a fight just now, how would this have shook out? Yeah. And he was like, not good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, well, there you go. Yeah. Well, I'm like, yeah. he's like, I'd have been out of air. Uh, I didn't really think about anything that was going on. I was just reacting and yeah. I and, didn't and, have and, a plan. And, and a lot of people, you know, we've all been there. We It's taken us years to get to this point, right? right? I mean, we've been in that pen a million times. But I think back of some of the first times I went in there, I really didn't know what to expect. I didn't know how it was going to go and whatnot. And that's the uncertainty part of it. So that does make you nervous. So I always just tell people, though, I, I'm like, if you get nervous in that show pen, get yourself in that show pen as much as you can. And you'll soon realize it's not a lot different. Yeah. You know, yeah, you got to put it all together there. But but it's it's still just you and that horse and that cow in the arena, you know. And and uh, so you just got to get yourself in there and get used to it. I mean, we talk about these young horses and we got to get them out and get them some experience and get them in that pen. It's the same thing, you know, for people too, you know. But uh, but I think it's I think it's interesting how how everybody – prepares themselves or their emotions, you know, before they show. And I know a lot of guys and I didn't realize it, but there's a lot of guys that are older and have shown a lot and get really worked up before they go show. It amazes me how nervous they do get. And I'm like, you've shown your whole life, but that's just them. You know, they, they, they just have a hard time controlling their emotions. And I and I know there's some guys that we show with that struggle with it, you know, and have struggled with it for a long time. And and I think they've gotten better as they've showed more, but I know I know a few of our top competitors that get pretty nervous right. before they show uh, in the cow horse world and in the reining world. I know a few guys that, that do and really struggle with it, but um the more times you can get in there, the better. You know, I think it'll help you. But, but I, I, I just know as far as your your frame of mind, what helps me the most and what I think help is just being prepared. You know, because if you're prepared and you've practiced and you feel good about where you're at, to me, confidence is is so much in what we do. 
you know, if you're confident in what it is, hey, maybe it doesn't go exactly how you wanted, but if you're confident and go in there and do it how you know to do it, that's half the battle, yeah. I think. And that's, and and for me, that's where I guess where I've struggled in my career. And I and I've told this to people, and and they find it. They're like, no way, you you don't trust your training or whatnot. But really, I that's been my downfall. I don't I don't know how many runs I've made in my life that I walked out and I'm like, you pansy, why didn't you just go show your horse? He was ready, but I but I didn't. I rode in the back seat just a little bit. I wasn't the driver. I wasn't out there trying to make a run. There's times I have, and I that's usually when I do my best, you know. But every once in a while, I'll get a little reserved and like eh, and afraid that something's going to go bad. And I think that's the perfection side of me, as I am. So- kind of a perfectionist about stuff and what i don't what? want i don't i don't no. i don't want it to go bad you know and so <laughs> it's you know but i that's how that's the mindset i gotta get in so todd in listening to you it's in in thinking early on in my career i didn't get nervous I felt like I didn't really belong there that much anyways mm-hmm. i knew what my horses would do and i would go and trust i trusted what i thought i had later in my career like you said if you're not prepared you get nervous Mm -hmm. it does if you're not prepared it doesn't matter what your mental game is yeah before you go in there you're gonna suck (laughs) that's the way it is i don't give a damn you can hold your mouth this way you can make yourself mad you can make yourself happy if you're not prepared you're gonna suck okay (laughs) right off yeah but then if you are prepared (laughs) some people need to feel like they're unbeatable some people need to feel like they're behind Mm -hmm. but whatever you find that lets you be Everything that you've got done without doubting yourself is what will make you the best in that pen. Mm -hmm. And just like we all have our own for me's, but for mine was if I got to the fence work and I'm a little behind and I'm like, okay, give them all you got because that's a bit it's going to take the best you got to make it so yep. don't doubt anything yep. and when you don't doubt anything that's when you have your greatest run for, sure. for sure whatever that takes for you in particularly mm-hmm. but you can't just go in there and not doubt on a horse that won't stop won't turn won't go with the cow when that when you don't have that all bets are off on mind preparation yeah because like you said if you don't, if you haven't done your preparation, oh yeah, no, the mind game. Only, <coughs> yeah, I mean that's, the mind that's game just what's only separating you the so guys. Exactly. Right, yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, you're not gonna yeah. will yourself into no, but, no, 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 no. But we've all seen the people who can train, yep. train, train, and train, and they cannot get their mind right. Yeah, you no. once you've got them trained, you've got to find the spot you need to be in to believe that you and that horse can do it. And I'm a little, I'm like you. Like there it's it's utter silence until mm-hmm. the whistle blows. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you anything mm-hmm. until that whistle blows. Then maybe I can hear the crowd or not. Yeah. Until that time if if I think I have a chance to win, there is it's just nothing but me and that cow me in that raining run Mm -hmm. because i'm believing in it and letting go and i'm trying to find all that i got yeah yeah no it's confidence is confidence is such a key key you know because you think about you you go through spurts when you're showing a lot of horses and you'll go through spurts where it seems so easy it's like mm-hmm. it's like this is easy. Every cow they kick in, you get it work good. Every time you go on your raining runs, smooth horses respond good. Herd works, 
pick the right cows, cuts are clean. It's just like, this is so easy, and your confidence just starts going through the roof. And then, to me, when you get to that point, man, you're just putting runs together, and it's all going good, and I'm confident in everything I do. And then you have two or three runs where it doesn't, and all of a sudden that's all gone. <laughs> and now right. you're questioning your training, you're questioning your horses, you're questioning your decision making. And do I have them too tired? Do I have them too fresh? Do I and, and now all of a sudden you're questioning everything you do. It just it's uh, it's amazing to me how our minds work like that because you can get your confidence level and you feel like you can do no wrong, but it only takes a couple of bad runs. And now all of a sudden you're questioning in your mind every every decision that you make. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys get like that. Yeah. But, oh, yeah. but Negative you, you, spiral. You start to just question everything. And that can that can just create more bad runs. Oh, it creates more <laughs> bad runs. It does. And it can just consume you. And I don't care if you've won ten million or ten bucks, it can consume you real quick. Yeah. And that's the part that I think everybody struggles with and i think everybody feels like they're the lone ranger i'm the only one that feels this way no. you're not everybody goes through it and and i've told that to i've done hundreds of clinics over the years and these questions like this come up all the time and they're like you you feel that way too i thought i was the only one and i'm like <laughs> uh uh-uh, uh bud i don't care if you're 10 years old and you're just getting started or you've been doing it forever i said it's in there and i said and it's crazy to me how quickly we can lose our confidence oh. you can sit there and train and do good and you've established a great program and you have proven yourself year after year after year horse after horse and you have a couple of bad runs, and I mean, it you're gonna goes, fall off a cliff. It goes away so fast. Yeah. And and I and I look at that, and I ask myself, I'm like, it's just a couple of bad runs. And as you get older, you learn to let those go, and and I think you have to. You learn from them, but you gotta let them go. And I think us, in the way that we show, and we show so many horses. You know, like it's not uncommon for us to show five, six head in a derby or a fraternity or whatever. I mean, because we can show unlimited amounts and stuff. <clears throat> but, but I, it's it's funny how, you know, you have, and, and I think you got to learn this, and we've all learned it the hard way. But you have to let the last run go and get on your next one, and and know what that horse what it takes on him how you feel about him and you got to just let that last run go whether it was great or it was bad it can be the best run you've had or it can be the worst run you've ever had you gotta let it go and just concentrate on that next one and go again you know and i think that's something that we've all learned to do that show multiple horses you know in a short span and stuff like that it's because to me what we do in the cow horses the cutters are, are a lot the same, you know, because they'll show a lot of horses and, and just really quick and stuff. The rainers, you know, they can only ever show three, and a lot of times you might only just show one a day, you know, where we'll show, you know, we might show mm. ten times in a day, right. you know, just depending on the schedule and stuff. And and it's easy to get consumed in those bad runs, you know. It seems like the good runs build and you, it makes you go go more, but it can take that one bad run, and it can just wipe away everything, <laughs> everything. that you've done. And yep. it's just it. I think about that all the time. I'm like, why did that one bad run make me question what I'm doing? Obviously, it's working, right? Because we've we've been doing good, and you've produced a lot of good horses, and you've produced a lot of good runs. Don't let that one run make you question yourself. No. Maybe question on that horse. Maybe I did something different, but don't question your whole program. And it's so easy to do, I think. So easy to do. And, and way so more of an inverted questioning mm-hmm. than on the outside. We remember the bad runs. Mm-hmm. The outside remembers the good, the good runs. runs. So that's if you so have true. a good run at the <laughs> that's show, so true. everyone said that's what they all remember is your good <laughs> run. Yeah. But you in your barn 
you remember the bad runs. Hey, that's so true. I've I've done several interviews over the years, and they ask me about, you know, what's your most memorable run and all that, and I'm like, I can't tell you. And they're like, what do you mean? And I said, I can tell you my bad runs. I was going to say, losing to Cal and Chinese Spark in the final. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, they're, and they're like, really? And I'm like, yeah, that's what sticks in my head are the bad runs. And they're like, explain that to me, you know? And, they're, and I'm like, the good runs, that's what I expected. And that's how I am when I I expected it to go like that. That's what I've been working for, training for, preparing for, is it to go like that. And so when it happens like that, I'm just like, good, we're good. But when it doesn't, that's, uh. that sits in my head forever. Yeah. And I can remember it. And I'm like, you know, what happened? Why was that bad? But I can I can remember those things. But I think that's the sign of a of of a good competitor and somebody who's who's very competitive and does good. I think that's a sign. Because you you remember those and you try and improve on those. Because to me, like I said, when I walk in the pen, I expect it to go perfect. It never goes perfect, but that's in my mind. That's how I was seeing it to go, right? And when it doesn't, then in my head now I'm like, okay, got to make that better. This, you know, what did we do wrong here? What, what, how come that didn't? What go a so disappointing good? world you live in. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, it's bad. Yeah. Well, that one that comes to my what? mind that was that happened in Reno. So I mean, that's been a minute ago, and that's the first one that jumps to my brain. Yeah, I, you know I, what I mean, mean. I, so. That's a really funny story, or it's a weird story about that horse. Smart luck. That's who you're talking about. Oh no no no! Oh, oh no! I'm sorry. You oh. He's got his own problems. Oh, yeah, I got oh, yours. Problems. Yours. Yeah. yours. You, yeah, both, yeah, you no. two both have the same problem. <laughs> yeah, yours. Every no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I said shiny sparklet. <laughs> oh, I, I thought you were referring to me no. and, and when it went bad. No, no I, did. I, I would never have brought that <laughs> no, up. I, never, I would never do that. <laughs> <to you. laughs> <laughs> How rude. <laughs> yeah. But that's a funny story right there, I think. In my I mean nobody really, I don't think knows it but you. Yeah, but Smart Luck. So so his name's Smart Luck, right? <laughs> so never name a horse like that. Yeah. Never so did. I'm at the fraternity and everybody knows, I mean like I'm fixing to win fixing to win the fraternity and I fall down, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I just got to get circled the other way. I've circled one way. I just got to get circled the other way. I fall Pretty down. Pretty close to the end. Fall down. Yeah, one <laughs> circle away. Fall down, go from winning it to, Zero. you know, getting a $3,000 check. Yeah. In, you know, last place. And that was a long drive home. It was only six hours, but that was a long drive home. Um, and then that horse, you know, I went on to do great on that horse. And I won a lot. And very special horse. And... But what do you remember the most? So that run <laughs> and then the last run of his career. You guys remember what the last run of his career was? I will as soon as you he say fall it. Fall down at the world's greatest? Yep. Yep. <laughs> so I go to the world's greatest. The first year I showed him at the world's greatest, I win the prelims by a long ways. I back fence a cow. Did you like two hundred forty six points in the raining or something yeah. on that horse? I, I back fence a cow in the in the finals of the herd work and end up third. Oof. Come back, win the rain work, win the steer stop, and second and third down the fence, end up third. I bring him back a couple years later. Going into the fence work, I am ahead by ten and a half points. Oh. oh. I just got to go make a fence run, right? I just got to go mm. just get them turned both ways and circle. That's 16. All, that's all I got to do because I'm 10 and a half points ahead. I won the rain work. I won the steer stopping. I was second in the herd work. 10 and a half points. I got a lead on second place horse. Go make my first turn. It's not great. Cow kind of comes off the fence. Go back, kind of angled back towards the fence. Got the nice little cheap shot right there, you know, the angle. Yeah. And that horse goes to the ground, goes to come out of it, falls square on his ass, flops on his side, jumps up. I end up sixth. <laughs> and that was the last run of his career. Mm. So the, I started off, and that was the only two times he ever slipped and went down. 
And all those times I showed him, that was the only two times. His name's Smart Luck. <laughs> and he ended it, started his career with bad luck, slips and falls down. Ends his career, <laughs> slips and falls down. That horse should have won another 150000 in his life. You know, uh, I, I won like 200 and some thousand and 70000 or something. Should have won another hundred fifty. <laughs> that one, that one was... And I and I loved that horse. I mean, I bought that horse as a yearling on the steps at Reno for Manny. She no sailed him as a yearling, and I wanted to buy him, and I missed him going through the sale. I got busy doing something, and I'm and I'm running up there, and I'm going up the steps to go into the Reno. You know, you got to go up all those steps outside. Yep, I know. And here's Annie coming out the door, walking down, and I'm like, "Did you sell Smart Luck?" She goes, he just went, but I didn't sell him. Score. And I'm like, I want to buy him how much you want for him. And I'm not even going to tell you what I bought him for. But <laughs> 250 But I, I bought him right there on the steps. And then, uh, and he was just an investment for me. And yeah. I start riding him. And, uh, you know, we get him home and break him out and start riding him and preparing him to run him back through the sale. Because that's what I bought them for. I bought them to train, turn over, to turn over, make a buck, right? And I tried to do that every year with a horse. I'd buy a yearling if I could get one bought for how I want and put some time in on them and sell them. I did that every year for a long time, and, and uh, so we're we're getting closer to the going to Reno, and I'm like, this is a good horse. This I really I really like this horse, and so I call Cindy. Warren, who was Cable Creek Ranch, and I'm like, I've got one here. I said, I think I've got a good fraternity horse for next year. Do you want to buy him? Ah, oh, well, I don't know. And I priced him, I think it, what did I price him? 50 or 75 maybe? And she kind of hem haws and decides, ah, oh, let's just, I'm, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. Like, okay. So then I get to the get to Reno and I'm riding them there, you know, when I can, you know, the sales not till yeah. later in the show, yeah. so I'm riding them when I can. Well, some people see me working them and they see me riding them and they're like, "What's that one?" And I'm like, "Oh, this is my two year old. I got him in the sale." And I got a lot of people on him. I mean, a lot of people on him. And John Roger has Scott Clark on him, and they want him bad. They want him real bad. And so I call Cindy back and I'm like, Hey, you know, are you going to, I'll still sell them to you right now. I said, but I, I need to know because I'm going to run them through the sale. And no, let's just go ahead and just go through the sale and, and uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I'm like, okay. But I said, I've got a lot of people on them and I got some big players. They're going to spend some money and I know they'll spend a lot, you know, and well, let's just see how it goes. And every, walking by everybody going, <coughs> bad extras. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And everybody thought that I set this all up, but I will honestly tell you, honest to God, this I offered this horse to Cindy three times before the sale, and she decided to wait for the sale. So he starts going through the sale, and so she says, get me on the phone when he goes into sale. So Missy gets her on the phone, and we start going through the sale. And next thing you know, it's to a hundred. Next Ooh. thing you know, it's to a hundred and twenty-five. And you know, back then, uh -huh. I was that was huge. That was huge, huge. And I see Missy over there in the corner, and she's got Cindy on the phone, and she's giving the you know every now. So Cindy's bidding on him. And I'm kind of looking around as I'm riding. Well, it's Scott Clark and John Rozier, and they're it's they're now, on it. They're on it. So it's it's Cindy against them, right? And Rozier's not going to have to ride him anymore. <laughs> Rozier is turning him out and Rozier, showing him show back up yeah, next year. Rozier, yeah. Rozier said that he's like this is broker than most of my three year olds <laughs> when she tried him out. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so we it's you know one fifty, one sixty. And so they've got them at, they have them at 160. 
and Missy loses Cindy on the phone. <gasps> oh, like, can she, you hear me now? Yeah, one of those deals. And I don't know if she had to call her back. I don't remember for sure how that story all goes, but somehow gets her back on the phone and they're like going, any 160, it's one, you know, like they're getting ready to sell them and get Cindy back on the phone at 165 and she buys them. Oh, gee, many Christmas. Yeah, and I got to keep them. And, and I can, on, I, swear to the day i die it was not set up at all i mean i offered her that horse for significantly cheaper before we even went and then again at the sale or at the show before the sale happened and all that and she decided she wanted to wait for the sale and turned out wow turned about to be a, a great horse and so cindy is cindy has been a customer of mine for man 20 some odd years now and we've done a lot of horses bought and sold a lot of horses she's been a great great customer and she's a great great lady and she's treated my family like family um just just one of those people right and so cool and anyways so smart luck you know we retire them and sound as can be and whatnot and just breeding a few mares here and there nobody ever really got on the bandwagon and really bred to them and whatnot and and no big deal she was never really in it for that you know she she could care less about the breeding and all that but we had some 10 people a year that bred to them you know and a few mares but then it was kind of tailing off and so she kind of quit promoting them and because she was advertising stuff but he's been at my place the whole time He's been at my house, and so he just retired there and stuff. And anyways, uh, just quit breeding. And we haven't bred anything for the last, I don't know, four or five years or whatnot. And so we brought up to Cindy. We're like, hey, what do you think about gilding them? Just his life would probably be better because he's a stud, so you always got to keep him away from the other horses, and you can't turn him out mm-hmm. with the other horses. And he's getting kind of study because nobody's really working him anymore, and so the kids don't want to ride him and whatnot. And anyways, we end up gilding him. We gilded him right before the stallion stakes this year. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. And uh, he's just so much happier now, you know, because he gets to go out with the other horses and – Everybody rides him now because, you know, he's just a gilded now. Nice to be around. Yeah. And he was never a bad stud. Right. But but after you've bred a stud. And then don't and ride And then him. don't. And now you're not riding him. And nobody, mm. you know. And, and he, he was never bad that way at all. And, and he never was really bad. But just nobody really wanted to handle him or be around him. And uh, so this is the kind of lady that Cindy is. She calls us the other day. And... She gave that horse to my daughter. <laughs> wow. Like, signed the papers over and gave him to Hallie. That's awesome. Wow. Guess what Hallie's going to do next year? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Youth world's greatest. She's like, I want to I wanna, I wanna learn how to do the cow horse, Dad. And I'm like, you spoiled little brat. <laughs> 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 like, I wish I had one like that to learn on. That is, Are you going to change his name? <laughs> one yeah, yeah. Maybe I should. <laughs> maybe I should, yeah. Dumb luck. Changed to bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> bad luck. <laughs> yeah. No, nah, but that, that he was a once-in-a-lifetime horse. That horse was... He was phenomenal. He was a cool horse. I just... That horse, what I tell people about that horse was he was so trainable and so honest, but like to a fault almost. Mm -hmm. Like I I learned through the years that I had to be very careful. You know how you go show and then you come home and you make some adjustments, right? Hey, I wasn't liking this when I showed, so we need to work on this a little bit. Or like I'll do it between prelims and finals. We all do, you know, it's like. And prelims, I felt him doing this a little bit. And so I'll go work on some of that for the finals, make it better. Well, that horse was so honest about that stuff. Like I said, almost to a fault that I had learned that I had to be careful how far I went with that because he would definitely take it to heart. Like, let's say 
something like he was getting too quick on a cow or something and you're like okay i need to back you off your ends a little or i need to make you wait a little well you better be careful how much you make him wait because that's he, might of, just wait. he might just <laughs> wait. wait exactly you want to wait dude? yeah Ooh, he, I'll we're gonna you wait. wait yeah <laughs> yeah exactly and but that's how he was but that's what was so cool about him because i learned that i think in his four-year-old year i learned that because i went too far one way and um but you you could you could change him over you could change that horse in one session with what you wanted to do and that's to me what made that horse so one he tried so hard like why'd you stop showing him i the that last time that i showed him i didn't feel like he was his i i felt like it really took its toll on him oh like you know the preparation yep. and the showing and all that he used to just i don't know it it felt like it really took its toll on him and i just told cindy i said that horse owes me nothing he's proven right he's proven right. he can win this deal yes we didn't win it you know i really 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 wanted to win the world's greatest on him nobody knows how bad i wanted to win the world's greatest on him because i just thought he was he deserved it you know and uh and it didn't happen but i felt like it really was taxing on him physically and mentally and and he was getting a little older and and he was sound and everything and i'm sure i could have showed him again but for some reason something just told me that time to stop it was time to stop and and that's why i told her i said i just i almost feel guilty <clears throat> making him go do all this again <laughs> You know, I, I don't know. Something he just, it felt like it really took its toll on him, you know, just physically. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I guess that was just, I, I just didn't want to do it to him again, I guess, you know. And I, I didn't feel like he had anything to prove. How old is he? I think he is 16, mm. 17, maybe now. Because I want to say I won the. Because I think his derby years were 09 and 10. So, so, it's four, nine. so it would have been an 06 model, yeah, right? Yeah. Is that right? Uh, I think so. I was going to look it up. Because that was, because uh, what, Raymanator ended up winning three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Raymanator won it that year. No, it would be a 05 model for 9 and 10. be 4 and 5. Yeah. But he probably in 05. So yeah, he's uh, yeah. 15, 18. 18. Is he that old? Yeek. Well, Jeez. that snuck up on you, didn't it? Yeah, dude. <laughs> old timer. Yeah. Married to an older but, woman. Yeah. <laughs> <An> old double nickel. <laughs> double nickel. No, but he was just, he just was one of those special horses, you know. Just well, he was like, the whole time you had him. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was. The smart luck was just an epic horse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something everyone strives for. Yeah. But like I said, I just didn't feel like he owed me yeah, anymore. I know. And I just, I just, exactly. I don't know. I just didn't feel like I wanted to just make him go through it all again, you know? Um, not that it was hard to prepare him or whatnot, but I know. You know, the shows are, it's taxing on him, you know, it yep. takes its toll and. And they don't know you because mm. there's all those horses that didn't win anything. <laughs> oh, nine. He's an 06 model. He's an 06. Yeah. That's what I thought. 06. Yeah. Because 09, I think I won the Derby maybe in 010. I think I won the stakes. 9 and 10. Well, and then. Not, 9 was his fraternity year. So. So he's an 06 model. Oh, so he was so at 10, 10, 11. 10, 11 then. Yeah. Yeah. I won the stake. I won the stakes one year in the Derby the next year, but yeah. But he just, you know. And then I won won the Bridal Spectaculars there at Paso on him two years, and mm -hmm. you know, won won the preliminary round at the World's Greatest. And I had a couple so of smart looks, and they were they kind of came from places where they weren't trained that great. Mm -hmm. But my 
God, couldn't they stop? Yeah. Holy mackerel. Yeah. And after, I don't know, two, three months, unbelievable what the kind of horse they became from what they were. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, if he. Stopping was just yeah. incredible. And that was that horse. I mean, he would just try so hard that I had to. I had to train him just a little bit differently on the stop, you know. It was all about the approach on him. It was not about the stop. It was all about the approach. That's all it was about. Did you from from the get go keep any semen on him? Yeah, any? yeah. He's got some straws. We've got huh. some, and I've got I've got a four year old. I'm showing by him, and he can stop. I stop mean, like. Just kind of the same way as he did, you know, just like, just as long as you got him running right, that's all you kill it. That's, yeah, same way on a cow. He reads a cow very, very well. And I've had some issues with him just training-wise. He was just a little funny-minded on some things, but he's he's better now. He's he's coming. Yeah. He's coming, but no, yeah, what a, he was a cool horse. He was, he was fun. He was quirky, spooky. He spooked at a lot of stuff. That's why his ears were always up. Everybody thought he was as pleasant. He was just spooking. <laughs> <laughs> the, one, the one I had jumped out of my ground load and just snapped the saddle horn off of my brand new saddle that I love so much. It just he was just goopy. Yeah. Well, but smart luck was what he was. Drag his yeah. ass, but yeah. There were some weird little things now and then. I, I remember showing that horse, I don't know how many times, and you'd be like in the rain work, you'd be running your circles, and his little ears are just like this. And everybody's like, oh, he's so cool because his ears are up and all that. And I'm like, I wish one was back. Cause just one. <laughs> just just worrying me a little bit how hard he's looking at those signs, you know. And But but the thing is, is his heart was so big, he would try so hard. if He would look, but he wouldn't he would never leave you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. He was, he was looking, but he would never leave you mentally. I mean, you could say, whoa, right there. And he was going to slam on the brakes. You know, that was just him though. He was always like that, but he was, what I had, was your, probably your favorite horse of all time. Oh, uh, or top three. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to pick one. I would probably say him. I, I think he's, was probably my favorite mm. just the trainability and the try and the success that i had and mm -hmm. um you know i had some others that I, were good horses and i did well on but maybe weren't as fun to train not that they were bad but maybe more challenging and mm -hmm. um you know you had to deal with some things but what was your first mm -hmm. horse that like moved you up today's my lucky day for sure, for sure, because that, I mean, I win the reign in fraternity as an assistant trainer on a horse that the boss man did not want to ride. Didn't want, yeah. <laughs> he didn't want any part of him because he was a tough sucker. He was really tough, and it took a lot of training, a lot of riding, um, but but it all fell into place at the end, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, I had won the, the senior reigning the year before. In 94, I won the senior reigning at the World Show. <clears throat> so that was probably my first really big win. And it was on a little Fritz Command mare that I shared with a non-pro gal there in the barn. Uh, and Bob let me show her. She showed her in the, non, or in the amateur, and I showed her in the senior and I uh, won the senior reign in honor that year. And then I came back the next year and I won the senior reigning again in 95 on a smart little Lena stud that oh, lean with me. Bob was reserve fraternity champion at the Snafflebit fraternity when he was three. And then that horse broke his pelvis. Oh, geez. Mm. Uh, he was, ah. he, we came home from the Snafflebit fraternity and we were going to a little fraternity up in washington and we had some other horses we we're going to show and he was going to take him and show him in the in the little rain and fraternity up there and we drove home from reno no we drove home from fresno because that was when it was in fresno that yep, year the one he was reserved <clears throat> and 
we get home like early morning. Like we leave soon as the show's over because we got to get home and we got to hold another string of horses to go to the show up there. It was a big circuit up there. And <clears throat> he had an outdoor arena and it had rained that night before and it was a little wet, but it wasn't bad. And so we were riding out there. And so he got that horse out to ride him and do a little bit on him. And he was turning him around. And he just, I was sat, I watched the whole thing and he was turning him around and that horse just slipped and just did the splits with his back legs oh. just went, and jumped up and then was just like acting all weird. And in long story short, he broke his pelvis and that horse was locked in a stall for, I want to say like six, seven, eight months, something oh, like that. Geez. Wow. Like just like just loose in his stall. And he wouldn't he wouldn't move his hind in. And so when we would feed him, you'd have to feed him wherever he was standing so he could just get there and get to his water and stuff. And then you could just see in the sawdust, you know, that all night that, you know, he wouldn't move this. He'd move his front end around a little bit, but he just protected himself. And anyways, that horse came back and, and I won the world That's on him. Incredible. Holy mackerel. In the senior reigning when he was older and Bob won the wow won the cow horse on him maybe too at the world show gee, gee many christmas but you want to know something weird like he was a smart little lena stud and he used to stop real wide behind and after that he stopped pretty straight and i don't know he if he said no i don't know if he that. learned that no or just from the injury and whatever it wow. made him but yeah he stopped pretty straight it was pretty weird Wow. Yeah. But anyway, so yeah, and then that next year I, I won the senior reigning and then I won the I won the snaffle bit or the the rain and fraternity on today's my lucky day. And then that's and that's when I left and I went to Arizona after that. But but that you know, I mean my name was kinda out there winning that senior reigning at the world show as an assistant. You know, people were recognizing who I was, but then when I came and I won the rain and fraternity you know, as an assistant yeah. trainer, that was really that horse that put me on the map for sure, mm. you know, and gained some customers in the reigning world. And right away, right away, I got sent quite a few horses because of that run, I'm yeah. sure. But, but it was, I mean, it was a big win. Like I won the first round with a huge score. I coasted them through the second round and was still high composite, and then win the finals with a 231, and then nobody had ever marked that back in that time. Mm. And, you know, you look back on that run now, and you're like, you laugh at it, you know. But, <laughs> but you know, but in that time, that I mean, time, it, was, it, it, was, was, it was big, you yeah. know. And so as an assistant trainer to, to mark that kind of score and dominate that fraternity, from the get go, that definitely launched my career. I would mm. say, for sure. How did um, so uh, like balancing the family life and the career? Even though you had kids late, because mm -hmm. we did too, but do you think that having them? changed you or had you changed and you were ready to have them both both i was ready for kids at that time but until you have kids you don't understand i i don't think i never did what it what it does to you one <laughs> one it puts a little pressure on you <laughs> you're like <laughs> I, I i gotta provide <laughs> i got two more i gotta take care of you know um so in that sense, but the thing that's so cool about kids is it really opens your eyes to uh, nobody really cares if you win or lose. It's who you are as a person at the end of the day, right? And I think kids really open your eyes to that because, because when you come home after a bad show and you want to 
you know, pout and you want to suck your thumb and you're bummed out and you open the door and the kids are so happy to see you and they want to play and they want to do whatever, it puts all of that in perspective and they're like, you're like, they, they could care less. I, I'm, I'm their dad and they're happy to see me, but they could care less if I won or lost. And that, to me, it changes your whole outlook. And, and I think sometimes, though, when, when you've had success and you've done well, it's easier to say that. But mm-hmm. when you have not reached some of your goals and you haven't had some of the, the success that you wish you could have, I think it's a little easier to say that. But, but I still believe, though, that kids really put that into perspective that this is what we do, and yes, you want to be great at it, but whether you're winning all the money and getting all the fame and glory or not, to me it's who you are as a person and what you put into it what what matters right and cuz those kids they you know yeah when they get older and they understand it more and they understand what you do and they want you to do good what not but still if i don't do good my kids don't look at me any differently mm-hmm. you know so i think kids really change that outlook on life and and who you are and how you treat people and things like that for me, what's kept me super grounded is living in Oregon. And and I love living there, and I love where I live. And I don't know that I could have done my whole career down here. I've been down here a lot, so I know how it is. But what's kept me grounded the most and what I really liked about living up there was all of my friends that surround me up there and that I hang with up there. Because none of them do this. Mm. They know what I do. And they know the success that I've had. But none of them are in the horse world. All of my That's fr- not why they like you. Exactly. Right. So uh, how much... And that, did- I, and that I like. I like hanging out yep. with those people that I know are my genuine friends. And they could care less if I've won one buck or a million bucks in what I do. Did when you married Missy, did it change you or were you so young that she's part of the growing? She, I was so young, she's part of the growing. For so sure. then, how much did her parents, who did so much for so many people, affect your outlook on being a person? Um, or was I, there a lot well, of that already? Yeah, I think because my parents were good. Were, yeah, were very much that way, and and like I said, would do any, you know, whatever us kids needed or wanted, or you know, they tried to provide that for us. Like I told you, my mom went and got a second job so I could ride, so I could show horses. She so, didn't, she didn't have to do that, you know. No, but so I think that upbringing like that, you know, creates creates who you are. But I think you end up surrounding yourself with similar type of people, if that makes sense. Yep. You know, and so. For sure. You know, so Missy's, her upbringing was different than mine, but in a sense it was a lot the same in in what was. Goodness. Family values and and beliefs and, you know, things like that. So, but, but getting back to the kids, it, it. They're the to, biggest change. Yeah, and to to me, just that part about them still loving you and wanting to be your kids, regardless of what you do in that show arena, that changes your perspective on the show arena. Yep. It does for sure. But like yep. I said, I, I think that it's easier to say that when you've had success because I think you can be more content and what you've accomplished. Mm-hmm. And when I say success, you, you know, that doesn't mean you have to win a million bucks. But, you know, 
you've produced some good horses and you've got a good business mm-hmm. going and and things like that to me that's success mm-hmm. you know but and provided for your own family mm-hmm. yeah no matter no matter how yeah but just that that part about they're still your kids and they're still going to love you whether you were first or last <laughs> you know that changes that changes how you look at things i i don't know anybody that could say it differently i don't think so no. Kid, kids change you for sure they change you absolutely they change you you know and if they don't and I, and i shouldn't say change you i think they just make you appreciate or you you they um, open your eyes a little bit they, to yeah what you yeah have. yeah that's i guess what i'm trying to say yeah they open your eyes and yeah. so then instead of judges Mm -hmm. giving you validity for your life Mm -hmm. your kids make you realize that hey being a good person's enough Mm -hmm. and i kind of feel like a little bit this world that we're (laughs) careening off into doesn't hold all that Mm -hmm. as much Mm -hmm. it's getting to be more of a win exposure world Mm -hmm. and good people don't have the value that they had it's amazing to me how people can idolize somebody because they're they've won a lot in what they do you know Mm -hmm. like a basketball star you see people that idolize somebody they Mm -hmm. don't even know them they they don't know them on a personal level and they idolize this person and i'm like how can you idolize somebody that you don't really know outside let's get them off the basketball court and let's go go hang out for a few days. You might not like that person at all, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But what does his kids think about him? His family, yeah. his fourth yeah. wife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. But what I, happens there? I, I, yeah. But I'm, I mean, you both have kids, yeah. don't you think it's changed your oh, for sure. outlook oh, on things? She, oh my lord! Yeah, it's you incredible. Know. Yeah. Kid. But I think that is the dynamic, though. I think when you have them older too, like say my career was pretty well established Mm -hmm. and so it like say it and i feel very blessed for that because i'm able i've got a good crew i've got i'm not just trying to burn them i mean Mm -hmm. we we might be out here at one o'clock doing a podcast but i mean (laughs) but uh, you know for the most part i can come in you know this morning she wanted to go ride her pony yeah Sarah's ready to go ride work horses. Well, I was ready to work horses too, but she says she wants to go ride her pony. Yep. Uh, that, that, that pretty much trumps everything. Yep. It doesn't really matter what I have on the plate. And if she yep. wants to go ride her, we've rode that pony at 11 o'clock at night. We've rode him at 3 o'clock in the morning. We rode him mm-hmm. at 5 o'clock in the morning. If she wakes up and wants to ride her pony, we're going to go, go saddle that little rascal up. I yep. mean, and that's hard sometimes because for me, that was hard. For, for me, the hardest part was when my kids would come to the barn that's my workplace, right? That's like, that's my office. And, and I had a hard time for a while letting that go and, and doing just what you said. Cause I'm like, God, I got to get these horses worked. I gotta, I gotta take care yeah, of this. I'm, I'm going to a yep. show. And then your kids come down there and I went through it for a little bit and it, it hurt me. It hurt me so bad. I felt so awful because my kids, said they didn't want to go to the barn because dad's just always working. Mm. That crushed me. When one of my kids said that one time, I I remember how old they weren't that old or whatever, but man, you might as well just stuck a stake right through my heart. It killed me when they said that because I was like, you're being selfish, you know? Mm-hmm. You you need to do just like what Chris said, and we're like, well, the horses are gonna have to wait for a sec because my kids are here, and let's go have some fun, you know. And because they started looking at the barn and the arena as not fun, right? They didn't want to go down there because we're just working, you know. Don't disturb me. We're working, you know. And and I was guilty of that a few times, and. Man, when I figured that out and when they said that to me, man, it killed me, you know. But that's, I think that's just part of learning to be a parent, you know. Oh, the learn the parent thing yeah. is awful. Yeah. It's awful. <laughs> you know, when mine came down there, it was just work. Mm-hmm. 
they did a lot of work. They didn't do much riding because they weren't good enough. Mm -hmm. So they did the work and I did the riding and that therefore they didn't wind up getting the finer parts of it. Yeah. So they wind up, you know, not going that way so much. Yeah. Um, there has to be a balance between doing the work and helping them see the parts of it that we enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know that they don't need to work, but at the same time, they, they need to see the fun parts too. Like Chris is saying, yeah. And, and that's what I've, what I learned is like, I got to make it fun for them while they're here. Yep. You know, so whatever that was, whether it was writing or not, right, whatever, but I need to, and, and this is when they were younger, you know, as they get older and, <laughs> no better but but when that when they were younger you know you got to make it fun for them you well know, because what's fun for us isn't fun for them not <laughs> <Yeah>. necessarily <laughs> yeah not necessarily fun for them but at the same time parenting's just like training horses there is no answer no there's no set you know there's, what there's i mean not a book <laughs> there was no my dad didn't it wasn't a do you want to rope the dummy you're going to go rope the dummy mm. because we have to brand calves <laughs> and you need to not be worthless. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you did it and then you got good at it and then it became enjoyable, yeah. but it was also part of life. At the same time, he was way better at just going and roping with me and going and having quail hunting or even going fishing, just doing stuff, mm -hmm. which I let that get away a lot in my, in the youth of my kids, because it was just so, we had so many horses yeah. and we were trying to do it all ourselves. And then, you know, the clinics come and yeah. all the judging, all that crap comes. Yeah. Then you're behind on the horses and it, it just, you got to slow down a minute yep. and recognize that you're teaching them work ethic, but you're also teaching them how to enjoy life. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, that's, that's a whole nother deal to learn for sure. And some kids <laughs> letting them like it works and other ones, yeah, that ain't the, really the path. <laughs> you, you know, your kids, you got to figure out what they are. Mm -hmm. just like you got to figure out what a horse is mm -hmm. to help it grow. Yeah. And it's, I think it may be easier when you're older, but it, when you're younger, you have so much more energy. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't no joke. <laughs> yeah. Gets to two o'clock now, I'm wanting a nap, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. like, dear Lord. <laughs> Oh, shoot. <sighs> well, well, all that being said, <laughs> knocked another hour out of it. <laughs> <laughs> what have you left out, Todd? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so much. So much, Russell. So much. <laughs> we haven't even started into our book of questions yet. I know. <laughs> We're For probably going to forego those tonight. <laughs> he, we hit some of them. We did, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to tune in for the last and final concluding episode of Todd Bergen's Life Up to Date. And if you think it's long listening to it, you should have been here when we recorded it in the middle of the night in my house on the back porch trying to not wake up my child. So yeah, we wrapped this up at about 2 o'clock in the morning one night. So, uh, like I say, you guys need to check this next episode that's coming out because don't make us have stayed up all night for no reason. So you guys check out this last episode and the stunning conclusion of Todd Bergen. Legend on a horse, legend on a podcast. Once again, this episode's been brought to you by Globe Life Family Heritage. Check them out at thomasagencies.com. <laughs>